But you, you thought power came with what you got. Yeah. Seen. Yeah. I thought it was just going to boost it. I figured it out. But whatever. You figure it out. It sounds like when I was trying to uh, figure out how to amplify an acoustic guitar, um, I bought a great... Yeah, get that mic a little closer into you, man. Yeah, I got a great pickup. A fantastic pickup. A dual humbucker with a noise canceling uh, programming or feature or whatever, and uh, fits in the sound hole. Had a nice 12 foot, uh, you know, cable coming out of it. It was removable. It was super easy to put in, take out. And then I came to find out it was passive. It didn't have any power. It, hmm. So it put out a really small signal, and then that signal traveled down a 12-foot cord, and the resistance of the cord after 12 feet made the signal even smaller. Right. So oh. when you plugged it into a PA or an amp, it was barely enough. You had to crank everything way up just, just to you know make it almost okay. And then I was like, okay, now I've got to investigate. Okay, I need a, a preamp. I need a, something to boost the signal before it goes to the PA or before it goes to the actual amplifier. So I had to buy. So I went, you know, got that. So that takes a nine volt battery and you got to make sure it's fresh, make sure it doesn't die in the middle of your gig or whatever. And so it's just like became more and more, compl more and more complicated. And I was like, you know, I played acoustic guitar because I didn't want to deal with all this electronic <laughs> right. crap, but you have to amplify it. You have to, you know, you have to find a way and there, there is no, really, there is no good way to amplify an acoustic guitar. Yeah, it takes nine volt. Do we have nine volt? I probably have nine volt if you want to, if you want to mess with it. But let's just, we'll worry about it next time. It's not a big deal. Oh, we can hear each other. What a nightmare. There's not a whole lot of distractions going on. There's not, we're not around an airport or any of that kind of stuff. But it's like, you know, you're getting that gift for Christmas. And then you get that gift for Christmas, and you're like, "Oh, you don't have yeah, the batteries, batteries not included, or whatever." Yeah. And you're like, "You gotta be shitting me!" Yeah, that always sucked. Yeah, Christmas Day, man, you get two, three gifts, and you can't even <laughs> play with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll take that off too. Yeah. Um, so have you listened to any podcasts at all? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I watched. Well, I, I watched. I, I didn't listen. I watched the YouTube videos of. Uh, I didn't watch every minute of all of them, but I I, I watched segments and skipped kind of skipped around and, and uh, watched Josh Jarman and uh, watched Paul Stone and I watched some of Richard Mallett and uh, and then, you know, just briefly looked at some of the p bits and pieces of the other ones. Um, right. But um, I was in a situation where I didn't have a uninterrupted hour to sit and just watch it all the way through, so I was kind of skimming it. But, uh, yeah, the, the uh, it was it was interesting because the first music part that I saw was Josh Jarman playing a song and you could hear his vocals, but mm -hmm. you couldn't hear the guitar. And I was like, "Where's the guitar? Why, why, yeah. can't, why can't you hear the guitar?" And then the next song, you could hear it. Like the next song, it was it was figured out. So. Yeah, it's growing pains we've had. Yeah, I mean, coming we, we've come a long way since Josh Jarman, to be honest with you. And yeah, I feel like sometimes we did Josh a little disservice, but we're gonna get Josh back in here and oh yeah, and uh, correct all that. Sure. Yeah, but I mean, his vocals were great, but his his main. Part of his show is the guitar, yeah, you know, and the, the tapping and all that kind of well, stuff. Well, again, back to yeah. miking an acoustic guitar. I mean, you, you were you were trying to do that here live, trying to mic an acoustic performance, and it's 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 tough. I mean, it's like I got a system now that that um, is is really good, but still, it's it's you know you got you got issues to deal with like feedback and um, you know I can't have a wedge monitor pointing at me, so and most places will have a little wedge monitor. For the artist to hear themselves, but I can't have that because it comes back into the mic that's right. on the guitar. So it's it's it's. Mm. Uh, I mean, there 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 are ways that are easier, but it involves uh, basically putting a hole in the bottom of your guitar so you can put guts in it, so you can put the electronics in it. The way they make acoustic electric guitars, you know, from the factory that those are those are by far the easiest because you just plug in and you go. Yeah. It's like you, you turn it into an electric guitar just like that. But the one that I got, um, the one that I wanted, um, Martin wouldn't do that. Martin said, well, we're not going to we're not going to put any electronics in it. We're not cutting any holes in it. It's acoustic. If you don't want it, we have plenty of acoustic electric models to choose from. We'll be glad to, to you know, customize one of those for you. And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I, I'm not going to compromise. This is the one I want. And, you know, I'm just going to have to work around the fact that it's not easily amplified or easily uh, electrified yeah and and i'm glad i made that decision because uh it's like surgery you know you, you can't uncut you know you you know and that and that's what it would involve would be uh, altering it 
So I right. can always I can always alter it later, but I can't unalter it. Right. Oh yeah. It's like the, it's like the barber used to always tell me. I, I you know. I can't put it back on, so decide what you want. You know, yeah. we'll take it piece by piece and get the, get it as short as you want it, but we can't put the hair yeah. back on, so, yeah. But anyways, <laughs> we're here with Ron Daniel, not Daniels. I put an S on his sheet earlier today, but it's Ron Daniel, a uh, local, what, what do you consider yourself, just a singer-songwriter? Singer-songwriter, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, it's funny you say local. I was thinking about it before coming out uh, the other day. I, I said, you know what? Every singer songwriter is a local singer songwriter. Well, true. <laughs> yeah, because true. you can't be anywhere other than yeah, where you, can you be are. Traveling. You could be traveling, like, but you're still yeah. local. Yeah, you're, I get what you're, you're saying. local somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. But no, I, I'm I'm not a local to uh, South Carolina or Somerville, or native, I should say, to Somerville or South Carolina. But I've lived here more than anywhere in my life. So okay. this is by far where I've spent more time. But I'm from Athens, Georgia. So okay, I thought you were going to say Ohio because it seems no. like everybody here is from Ohio. But no, no. No. Athens, Georgia. Are they? So not too far away. Yeah, there's a shit ton of Ohio transplants down there. Oh, you mean it's in like general? a running, it's like the I running you joke. Meant, like guests on the show so far. No, no, just in general in, in yeah, town. Yeah, that. everybody comes down from Ohio. Gotcha. You thought a good metal Sorry, band track come of. from Ohio. I'm not gonna keep track of that. <laughs> keep track of it. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep like my so Athens, book. Georgia. So what brought notes. you over here? Um, my dad was in the Air Force, and uh, so we moved here in '74. And uh, I grew up on Charleston Air Force Base from okay. seven, 74 to 80. We moved away, moved several other places, and then uh, they moved back in 87, right after I finished high school. And uh, I went off to college and did my thing and lived in Atlanta for a long time and, uh, and then uh, you know moved back and then moved away and moved back and, and finally uh, moved back uh, for good in uh, uh, 05, so, uh, or actually 04. Yeah, came back late '04 and uh, and just uh, put down roots and said, "This is it." You know, I'm I'm not I'm not going to bounce around anymore. This is a great place to be, and uh, you know, mom and dad are here, and you know, got my got my kids and uh, going to school, and and uh, so now I'm now I'm rooted. I think I think this is it. This is where <laughs> I'm, this is where I'm going to retire. You know, okay. I'll probably travel a lot, but I'm not. I don't think I'm going to move again. All right, I'm tired of moving. It's Fair a lot enough. of work moving, and it's yeah just mentally as exhausting as it is physically for the most people i guess yeah i don't, know. A lot to I don't want to inter- interrupt this conversation but i think we need to open a beer oh yeah i was Sounds gonna good. i was gonna do that if you did not well i'm doing it we got um yeah which, what are we drinking first drum roll please first thing we're gonna do we picked oh, up you're um, a musician <laughs> that's right we could do a drum roll sometime we'll get somebody in here on the drums eventually do some drum rolls how about that yeah um, oh man, I hate that he tapes this thing all up too. I have to untape it. Oh, this no. is going to be a trade show. Um, it's a hazy pale ale from Holy City Brewing Company. I don't have a description. We use Untapped here on the show. Um, sponsor us if you'd like to untap. But um, mm-hmm. they don't have a description for this beer on here. But you know, it's just a hazy pale ale. Five point eight percent alcohol by volume. No IBUs listed. Usually these hazy pale ales and IPAs are pretty, uh, pretty juicy, pretty citrusy, um, pretty light bitterness, or it's just a balanced bitterness, so it's not that in-your-face uh, IPAs of old. So we'll get it open here eventually. Where's that Jeopardy song when you need it? I know, right? God, this tape is not cooperating. This might be the first time. Caleb probably did that on purpose. He probably did. And yet again, he has mentioned in yeah, another he, episode. Every podcast we mention uh, Caleb, but he's still not paying us any money. <laughs> but he will. He will. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're going to have Caleb in here on Thursday. Is that correct? Yeah. He double checked right before I ran out of the bar. Yeah. It's going to be a late show for him. Good for Lord, us. look at this. Tape is attacking me. All right, here we go. <laughs> Holy City, hazy uh, pale ale trade show. Coming at you. That is hazy. It's Very cool. nice. Yeah. Very hazy. Wow. Give you that one there, Ron. Thank you, sir. Caleb. Hmm. It's beautiful looking. Yeah. I'll top top us off a little bit. As always. 
Hey, man, that's like the best part. You get a little bit extra. That's right. A little bit there. You guys want to cheers the first one? Sure. Yeah. Let me get the jazz back. Wow. Who are we going to cheers to? Who wants to do it? Oh, cheers to my favorite self IPA. Yeah, hazy right. IPAs. There we go. Thanks, Ron, for coming in. Thanks for having me. Hmm. Wow. Very citrusy on the nose. I mean, like all the citrus flavors you can smell in there. I, I can't really discern any particular one, but... Uh, that's grapefruit. That's... Yeah, definitely grapefruit for sure. Real nice hop uh, bitterness on the end, but not overly hoppy. I mean, it's a nice balance, I think. Yeah. I think they did a great job with this. I, I've had this plenty of times, actually. Wow. But... This is my first time. Really? Yeah, I, I think it's great. Because it's nice and it's juicy, like what I look for every New England style. This has more bitterness to it, which is something you don't get often, which is really pleasant. And like a little, it's like a bittersweet kind of, bittersweet kind of thing. Right, it is. And it, like <laughs> I said, I've had it many times. I, I try and get down to Holy City about once a week. I usually go on a Sunday, either try and hit their brunch uh, before 3 o'clock or either after 3, hit their regular menu. And it's a great spot. They do good things down there. They've always got uh, 20, 25 beers on tap. Um, Have you different ever been varieties. out there? No. No. Oh, it's a wonderful no, place. Yeah. Great outdoor spot. Um, Food's delicious. The food is fantastic. There's People a cat. Are great. What's the cat's name? Mr. Meow. Mr. Meow. Where is it? All the way down Dorchester? Yeah, it's way down on the, 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 the North Charleston side of Dorchester Road. Uh, almost down to the... You, you almost hit the I-26. Okay. Yeah, it's a exit 215 if you hit... Yeah, if you take the interstate. the interstate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I usually just go straight down Dorchester. And it's in like an abandoned, obviously it's not abandoned because they live there. Yeah. But it's a giant warehouse behind a Champion Honda motorcycle dealership and repair shop. Okay. Yeah. I think it probably used to be part of that garage or something, but they're getting ready to move, actually. I don't think Where so. You? I think it was just, I don't know if it's a Champion Honda. Well, I mean, they Honda got the garage doors it. and stuff, so I'm assuming maybe it was some kind of auto shop. But I don't know. Garrett's never mentioned that to me. Who knows? I don't know. They're getting ready to move locations, though, by the way, but we're going to get those guys on and talk about that another time. we got Ron Daniel here in the studio. Um, this is delicious. This is uh, everything. When you said juicy, I was kind of like, I didn't really heard that word used to describe a beer, but <laughs> that's spot on. It is. It's 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 almost like a... A fruit version of a beer. It's it's uh, but it's got a interesting uh, something about it. Reminds me of a wheat beer, like a, a vice beer. I can see I that, mean, and it, probably because most wheat beers are unfiltered, and this is an be. unfiltered IPA. It's it's, so. it's more of the texture, like the, the mouth feels right. right. Something, and something they may about use it. a little bit of wheat in the in the boil. I don't know. I'll talk to them. I might go down there tomorrow, so we'll find out maybe some more information about it. Half a vice, half a vice in. Right. Yeah. Half yeah. a vice with the with the orange wheel on the. Uh, on the pitcher. Yep. That's what I started with. That's what I started Reed with, beers. too. Yeah. Definitely. Those were huge when I was uh, just, like, second, third year of college. It was, like, swept Athens, Georgia. Everybody was drinking the cloudy beers. It was, you know, the orange peels everywhere, orange rinds everywhere. You know, <laughs> yeah. Orange wedges, I should say. Right. Yeah, the, the Hefeweizen. Just, yeah. Just that word was, like, thrown around like crazy. And I was like, where did this come from, you know? Why, why is all the beer cloudy all of a sudden? I wish so that's had. where you went to school, University of Georgia. I I um I did I I did a um an unusual uh, higher educational path. Um, I was on the eighteen year program. Oh, yeah. Um, I did uh, six institutions of higher learning uh, over an eighteen year period, two institutions twice. Um, so two of the six were doubled up, um, and uh, at a cost of three point eight million dollars, and I did finally get a bachelor's degree. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. It was the, the most it. long, awkward, in, inefficient, uh, ridiculous path to get a bachelor's. And oddly enough, my bachelor's is uh, the most fake sounding, worthless degree. I have a, a bachelor of science in interdisciplinary studies. Okay. <laughs> and I always said it sounds like something a third year sophomore would tell his parents on the phone. You know, I'm switching my major, mom and dad. Oh, again? What are you... Sw I'm going to interdisciplinary studies. Yeah. You know, what the hell is that? Well, it's when you just 
can't really pick a major and you just study a bunch of 101, 102 level classes and eventually they feel sorry for you and say, look, you've given us enough money. Here's a bachelor's degree. Just go home. Right. Just, okay. just, just, you're done. You, you got over, I got over 235 credit hours or, wow. you know, uh, and like I said, it took 18 years to do it, but right. And tra- probably a lot of them gave you trouble too, right? Like we're not going to well, accept these hours. credits. Oh and- yeah. I lost, I lost probably in the, in, in, in all the dropping out and going back. Cause I mean, six eight it was 10 different trips so so six institutions two were doubles so yeah i think that's my math is right that's 10 10 different times entering college and every time i entered except the first time of course uh, i lost some kind of ground i lost at least one class yeah so i probably ended up having more like 280 credit hours uh but i didn't keep all of them um but yeah charleston southern um finally felt pity on me and said uh we have this degree for people like you, um, for people who have a ton of credit hours, but they're not really adding up in the right places. Um, and, uh, you know, so we created this degree for people like you. And, uh, <laughs> and you, you, all you have to do is do 35 in-house hours, which is our minimum for anyone to, do, to get a degree. Do 35 in-house hours. And in those 35 hours, you have to uh, have two religion classes and one computer, uh, intro to computers which is required for all of our degrees. Right. And I said, deal. And so three semesters later, I walked out with a shiny new bachelor's degree. Right. And, and uh, what have you used that for? Anything? Um, you know, the only thing it's helped me with is just, just a sense of completion and satisfaction of knowing that True. all yeah. that effort wasn't in vain. Um, because it would have really broken my heart to have always checked the some college box. Because I did more college than you know most doctors. I mean, yeah. I, was, I went to more colleges and attended more classes and took more tests than most people do when they you know get a master's so to not get the degree would have just been a real shame and, yeah uh, and, uh, understandable so, so it's, it's not helping me at all in, in any practical sense though um it's, it's completely worthless in that sense right you got a really good story it was it was a hell of a run i mean it was it was all about procrastination and and <laughs> being wishy-washy and what it boiled down to really mainly was um i kept asking myself what, why do I want to get this degree? And the, the main answer that I kept coming up with was because I started this process and I should finish it. And my mom and dad want me to finish this and they're pressuring me to, to get the degree. And everybody, everybody in my family is telling me, oh, your life will be so much better. You'll make so much more money. You're, you'll be so much more successful. You've got to do it. you got to do it. But I never really, the answer never was I'm doing it for myself. I was never doing it because I wanted it. And the job that I would get from getting this, you know, magical piece of paper, the job that I would get was a job I didn't want. I said, you know, I don't want to be a guy in a suit. I don't, I don't want to be, you know, junior vice president of marketing for some company that I don't respect and don't like. I, why am I doing this? Why why am I, why am I working so hard to be a sellout phony Mm -hmm. with a business degree? Cause I mean, that's, 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 the jobs that's the way I looked at them at the time. I was like, those people to me are sellout phonies and, and you know, I, I don't believe in what they're doing. I don't like their, what their work. I, why do I want to join them? You know, why, why do I want to be in that club so bad? You know? Right. And, yeah. yeah. So, if you could go back and do it again, what would you, what would you like to get as far as a degree? Is, is there something you, know, you would, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I would go to college for the experience. Um, I would do what a lot of my friends did, which was just go for the social the social education for the, for the cultural experience. Yeah. I would go and I would take whatever classes interested me. I'd take, you know, a bunch of PE. I'd take, uh, you know, art appreciation. I'd take, you know, just classes that were fun and interesting. Never. And I would never pursue a degree. I would just, I would just hang out for three years and play hacky sack and have fun and drink beer and chase girls. And, <laughs> and then after, <laughs> after that, I would say, okay, well now it's time to do something to get a job. Now it's time to actually, you know, pursue a career but to me the career path of high school bachelor's degree enter the workforce and never look back that stopped being relevant about 1978 yeah i I think i agree it's just it's a dead end unless unless you're majoring in one of six majors computer science physics biology mathematics um accounting Right. There, there's engineering. just there, engineering that, yeah. that's about it. But if you're majoring in any of the other 211 majors that, that the university of Georgia offers, you're literally wasting your time unless you want to go and get a master's. And then 
chances are you're still wasting your yeah. time. I mean, a lot of people so. say, well, you'll make, you know, an extra five grand a year, maybe 10 or something. Well, just to get hired, you you have to have a master's in a lot of these things just to even have a chance of getting an entry level oh, yeah, foot sure. in the door. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, yeah, it used to be a bachelor's, but you, bachelor's oh, no. pretty much doesn't get you anything anymore. That's, I but. mean, yeah. And even, even with engineering, there's, you know, that's still, there's still another level. I found out David B was telling me that uh, a bachelor's in engineering makes you, uh, I forget what they call it, but you have to go back basically and get some other certification, which is kind of like a master's before you're an engineer. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. So even with even with the bachelor's in engineering, it's not the end of your education by any means. It's 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 the first step. Um, but yeah, I, I I went to Trident Tech, and for you know a two year program that was you know come to Trident Tech, complete the two year program, walk into a job. And this program does nothing but prepare you for that job. Right. And, and the degree you get from us is an associate's, and it is what is required for the job. And, there, and you know, it was, it was so cut and dry. It was, you know, Trident Tech, job. Right, job placement. And, and I, was wor- I was working. I, I graduated in May, and I was uh, making more money than I ever made in my life by October. And I've never looked back. I'm still there. I mean, and, and that's where I'm going to be till 2037. So what so. is your day job? I, uh, I'm a diagnostic radiologic technologist. Okay. That's which so is a cool. super fancy way of saying X-ray tech. X-ray tech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but that, that is but, super fancy. But that is the, official, that is the official title, diagnostic radiologic. So when I apply for a loan, that's what goes mm-hmm. on the application. Yeah. yeah. And what, what, what do you do, Mr. O? I'm a diagnostic radiologic technologist. Yeah. So is that at Trident? Trident Tech. Yeah, Trident Rivers Tech. Avenue. It's, no, I mean Trident Tech College, but Trident... Co- uh, oh, hospital? No, no, I work for the VA. I work for, oh, okay. Yeah, work very for, nice. Work for well, Uncle thank you Sam very much. at the VA. and uh, Downtown? Yep, yeah, and uh, that's where I get my health care. I'm a vet, and uh, I actually had my knee surgery there in 2005. And on the way out, my dad said, you know, if you uh, if you do that x-ray school thing, maybe you could end up working here as an x-ray tech. And, I, and it was kind of like the little light bulb went off, and I <laughs> said, yeah, that's that that's a pretty good idea you know that's actually that's actually a great idea yeah and this is before i was even in the program before i'd even gotten on the waiting list i just sort of talked about it um but it was a two-year waiting list to get into the program i had to wait two full calendar years to get my slot they only take 25 students a year it's the only program between here in columbia um and savannah um so the it's the entire low country 25 students a year that's it hmm. and uh so yeah. it's it's same high demand. With, it's hard to get into. Yeah, same way with physical therapy. That's what I did in the Air Force. Physical therapy and, that, and those programs are just the wait list is just out the door. Mm-hmm. All the medical programs I yeah. think are kind of like that. I had to like wait that. two years to get in the nursing program. Yeah, but I mean, it's that tells you it's a good thing because if if that many people are wanting to do it, and and, and like my, you know, my situation, graduation, application, employment. Right. And, and like I said, I, you know, immediately right off the bat as a, as a GS five, step one, the lowest, the lowest grade for an x-ray tech at the VA is GS level five. Mm-hmm. As a five step one, I was making more money than I ever made in my whole life. Right. And my first like three or four paychecks, I just, I couldn't believe it. I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is great. This is, this is what education is supposed to do for you. Yes. Unless you're wealthy and you're just going to enrich yourself, which I, by all means, if your family has money or you have yeah, money, that's fantastic. And you just want to go and drink from the fountain of knowledge, by all means, go to college and take all the classes you can stand. I mean, be a professional student. I mean, it's I love college. I, yeah. I, I'd love to go back and and uh, you know if they take me back, uh, and I could you know go back to that lifestyle. It, it was awesome. But <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know the S C E and G is. They, they don't accept uh, potential. Um, they want cash. So. Yeah. I know, right? So uh, have you always been with the VA, or did you start yeah, somewhere else? Yeah, no. I, I, the I, whole time. I, I, I was sitting at graduation, and uh, cap and gown, you know, sitting there, and uh, one of my classmates leans over and says, I know Ron applied for that VA job because he, he, you know, he, he was in love with that place. And <laughs> I, I said, what VA job? Because we'd all been checking the websites and message boards, and this was 2010. Uh, the job market was... Uh, just horrible. It was mm-hmm. awful. It was uh, the the peak of the recession. There were there was there was nothing. There were no jobs, no jobs. And I said I said, come on guys, you don't don't tease me. You know, they, you know I'd like to work there. They're like, well, didn't you apply? I said, what are you talking about? And they they said they posted two jobs. And I said, when? Last week. 
I had literally stopped looking because I said, you know, I don't want to spoil my graduation. I don't want to like walk into graduation being bummed out that there's no jobs. Yeah. So I just stopped looking for a week. I said, I'm just going to enjoy this week. It's my final week. I'm just going to enjoy graduation. I'll, I'll pick up the job hunt later. And so I literally went home that night, got on the computer, saw that the openings, uh, the application process was going to close on May 18th. And this is like May 7th. Mm-hmm. I said, man, I got to get on the stick. So I, I yeah, there's not an, USA Jobs. Yeah, USA, yeah, it's not an easy process. USAJobs.com, and uh, I mean, it ended up being a packet of information I had to come up with. I had to download a lot of forms. I had to mm-hmm. come up with, uh, you know, all these previous addresses for the last seven years or ten years or something like that. Yeah. I, every everywhere I've worked, name, address, phone wow. number, all kinds of. I mean, I was digging deep in the file drawer looking for all this stuff because if you. Uh, if you don't have it all filled out, then then they basically toss your application. If it's not perfect, if it's not 100% accurate and all the initials and signature lines, and it, it just goes in the shredder. And the two jobs that, that were posted, um, there were over 80 applicants uh, for those two jobs. And these are what are called PRN jobs, uh, as needed. That's PRN means as needed. So basically you work when they need you. Uh, no benefits, no guarantees. Um, at the time, there was no no shift differential, no weekend differential, just a straight hourly rate, and an indefinite uh, probation period. Um, you could be let go at any point. No no job security. No no one year probationary period. It was just you know, mm. you, you you serve at the pleasure of the director, and you know if they if they want to say hey it's been great but you know we we don't need you anymore then you have no recourse you just you're out the door bare bones yeah it's it's a foot in the door though it's it's really truly a foot in the door it's like an extension of your interview basically it's a working interview and uh for those two jobs um 80 applicants i think the average level of experience of the applicants was like 10 years of experience 80 applicants 20 of the applications were not perfect they went in the shredder Mm -hmm. which left 60 perfect complete correct applications of the 60 they only interviewed 16. Mm. I was one of the 16 interviewed and one of the two hired. And uh, so I'm extremely fortunate and lucky to be in that job because yeah. there's no one on the planet that can convince me that of the 60 applications that I even deserved to be one of the 16 interviewees, mm. much less, you know, you can't tell me that I was, you know, truly the best of the, right. of the 16. I think it was fate, luck. Um, you know, good fortune. Um, just, but you know, I'm happy I, I took it and, uh, yeah, it's yeah. tough. I've applied for numerous jobs. Well, when I retired from the air force, I applied for numerous jobs on USA, uh, jobs for VA slash, uh, government jobs, you know, on air force bases, whatever. And I didn't get selected for any of them. And, and I felt like I had a pretty good resume, Yeah, you know, but, um, you just miss a couple different, a couple pieces, a couple boxes that you don't get checked off. And, they, like you said, shove you to the side. They, put, right they, the they literally put it in the shredder, and yeah. uh, it's their it's their way of thinning the, the the stack. You know, they 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 can legally say, well, we don't have to look at this. We don't have to give them an opportunity to complete it or to correct it because it was submitted in an insufficient way. We can we can just put it aside. Yeah, and we've got a big pool of other people to choose yeah. from, so forget about it. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I had a five point veterans preference, which was the only reason that I got hired. Um, Basically, they go on a point system, and you know your your education gives you so many points, your interview gives you so many points, um, your experience level gives you so many points, and at the end of the end of the process, they literally look at the points, and then if there's a tie, then they go based on their their gut feeling or you know what the department uh, people say that they want. Uh, but that point system um, was there was no way I was going to be in the running without the five point veterans preference, uh, because I had served in a combat zone for more than 120 days, I had that five point preference. And that literally put me probably one point above everyone else because right. there was no one else in the pool. And that's that's who, usually the way it works. Who had that five point preference. So, yeah. um, you know, people with disability ratings and those type things, they get a 10 big, point, they would get a 10 yeah, point preference. Big... Yeah. And the 10 point preference would have would have smoked me. I would, I would, there's, you know, that person would have, would be there instead of me, but we didn't have anyone in that, in that pool who had the 10 point preference. Um, luckily for me, um, yeah. cause well, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have got hired. Let's branch off of that. I mean, what did you do in a combat zone? What was your job? Yeah. Um, I did uh, flight operations, um, aviation operations specialist. 
<laughs> Another long title. Yeah. Which which is basically flight ops guy. Um, which is basically uh, flight operations. Uh, you have the people who fly the aircraft. Obviously, the people who service and maintain and fuel and but, but those are the people on the flight line. And then the people off the flight line, you have the control tower. Those are the uh, air traffic controllers. And they're basically traffic cops um, for everything they can see. You know, you go here, you park, you go there, you fly, you come in, you stop, you go, you mm-hmm. circle around. They're basically glorified traffic cops. Um, and they direct traffic. Um, and then the flight operations does everything else. Um, they file the flight plans they keep track of the pilots hours they um keep everybody up to date with weather they uh hand out what's called squawk codes um to the pilots they have the manifest who's on the flight where are you going when are you leaving what are you taking with you when are you coming back um and it's all tracked so you track the aircraft from the minute they file the flight plan till the minute they say you know we're back you you have it on a board it's a big huge board and you're constantly updating you know you know where where everyone is you know you're you're basically keeping <clears throat> keeping tabs on everything and then the the big thing is um you do all the um uh crash investigations so flight operations has to uh investigate all the crashes and file all the paperwork for that um and uh that was that was a great job it was it was amazing because uh I didn't think I was going to get deployed when I joined uh, the Army. I joined in March of 2001, and everything was really quiet then. There was, you know, Bosnia was way in the rearview mirror. Uh, there was nothing going on militarily. It was super sleepy. It was chill time. And uh, <laughs> I went to basic training and got hurt, got recycled, went to basic again. I was stuck at Fort Jackson forever. And while I was there, 9 11 happened. Mm-hmm. And so by the time I finished, basic training went to AIT we were already getting involved getting ready to go to Iraq so I got to my unit and I was at my unit for a few months and they said okay we're on alert we're we're gonna go and I said damn you know this is amazing you know I, I basic training go to school learn how to do flight ops get to Fort Carson Colorado and now we're getting ready to go to the sandbox and you know drug is left I was just at Fort Carson yeah, beautiful yeah. place. Yeah. Oh, awesome. beautiful base. Is that where the race was? I didn't care too much for Colorado Springs. Yeah, was on Fort Carson. Oh, the mount, the yeah. Mountain Post. Yeah. The, the Mountain Post. Didn't mean to interrupt you, but no. yeah, it's there. So you went where? So went to uh, went to Iraq um, with uh, the 4th uh, Squadron, the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment. Um, and uh, just as a side note, if you've ever seen uh, Apocalypse Now, um, the scene where the... Uh, I want to say he's a major. The major is standing there with his uh, black Stetson and no shirt, and uh, he's he's talking about Charlie doesn't surf, and you know mortars are coming in, and he's just strolling around on the beach, and everybody, everybody's <laughs> got their heads down, and he's giving a speech about how Charlie doesn't surf, and and uh, I think it's Robert Duvall. Sounds right. Anyway, uh, that scene, that's a classic scene where you're like, man, this, this guy is insane, you know, and he's wearing a Stetson. And he's and he's and he's not even flinching when these mortars are coming in. That's how the cavalry really is. Yeah. And then they they do wear the stetsons, and they are balls out, fearless and crazy, absolutely insane. Those those pilots <laughs> those pilots would fly into the gates of hell yeah. if you dared them to. I mean, they they have no common sense. They have no fear or common. Sense. I mean, they're they're just. But the, but the weird thing about it is that they're not the only branch of the military or, or unit in the military that's that way there's a lot of hardcore branch you know hardcore units and whatnot marines are known for that sure special forces but, all those but the funny thing about the cavalry is a close second to their to their uh you know whatever unwavering bravery and and insanity is this they have this thing called panache and panache is like style points. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not enough. To, it's not enough to you know to you know to, to, to be a badass at your job or to or to you know fly the hell out of the helicopter. They want to look good doing it, and it's all about how you look. Boots shined, Stetson hat. You know the spurs on the boots. The uniforms like super crisp. I mean, uh, it's it's really amazing how. It has carried over from back in the day when they were horse mounted, 
with the with the you know the fancy leather boots and the yeah, sabers. It's, and, it's funny you mention all that because, like I said, I just left four cars from them. That's why I'm wearing this shirt today because I did that just this past Saturday. But it was probably one of the most memorable Spartan races I've done because they actually brought three horses, three cavalrymen out there to start the race off. So they were at the at the starting line. They all raised their swords. They went like this. The horses took off, and we all took off running after them. So that's it was pretty. Awesome. Yeah, it was pretty badass. Man, you should have worn one the, of the best starts out there. Yeah, I should have actually. Yeah, that would have been awesome to watch. Next time, well, I told my son I was retiring after this one. But, really? Uh, I think Come I'll, on. I think I'll do another one. So you got it now. Yeah, we got you now. Either that or we'll just hook it up to uh, Brian Dale's the updated version. That's right. <laughs> you probably have a better show than I did. But so where were uh, you stationed over in Iraq? Um, we uh, we went to Kuwait first, and uh, then we crossed the berm, as they call it. We we convoyed from Kuwait into Iraq. And we, oh really? We did a marathon convoy. I was driving. Um, I was a, I was the uh, squadron commander's uh, personal driver, and uh, so I had the uh, the command Humvee. Um, and going back to the Panache thing, uh, before we left, the colonel sent me to uh, an alteration shop. He said, uh, he said, I need you to go pick up something. Here's a, here's some cash. Go pick this up for me. Uh, it's some flags. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I, I did errands for him all the time. I'd pick up his dry cleaning or whatever, you know, whatever he needed. I was, I was his butler, driver, right hand man. Sure. Heated water for his shave in the morning. What, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. I mean, I was, I was Radar O'Reilly, uh, and uh, <laughs> but he was the SCO. He was the squadron commander. He was, you know, he was the top dog in the unit. And so, by being close to him, and 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 you know, I was the top dog in the unit because people were like. Daniel is the SCO's driver. He has the his ear. They're yep. buddies. They 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 talk. You know they 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 hang out. You know you 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 know you want to be good to him because he's got the ear of the old man. You know and uh, you know and vice versa. I mean it was it was neat. It was like being close to power kind of gives you power. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't abuse it. I didn't you know I, I didn't have a big head about it. I, I respected that you know that it was it was could be taken away at any moment. But I just enjoyed it. But uh, he had me go pick up these flags huge gaudy ridiculous amazing cavalry flags with our unit red and white cav flags with you know four or three and i was like sir what are these for he goes oh they're gonna go on the humvee <laughs> and i was like awesome my first thought was that's gonna kick ass man we're gonna have these two big huge red and white cav flags flying just <laughs> flapping away yeah well we get there and i'm like started realizing wait a second you know all the vehicles look identical and we didn't wear rank over there because you don't want snipers to see what your rank is you don't want anybody to know who to shoot Mm -hmm. then you don't salute in a combat zone there's no saluting a general four-star general walks up you better not salute because when you salute the sniper (laughs) says that guy (laughs) must be important everybody's saluting him you know he's he must be in charge that's good thinking so nobody salutes everybody body language wise is just the same you know mm-hmm. from the lowest rank to the highest rank you're just you're just a person walking around and i said wow oh, these flags are really going to make us stand out you know so he's like all right daniel we're crossing the berm put the flags up you're the lead vehicle i'm like great so i put the flags up and i'm like man i just made myself the biggest target in this country <laughs> i'm literally a rolling target yeah. and uh as soon as he's out of my sight i went somewhere in the vehicle i got waved down pulled over and this major's like what the hell are you doing i said sir what do you mean he's like what's up with the flags are you trying to get killed you (laughs) idiot you know take those down right now yes sir take them down you know i took them down fold them up get back to the unit colonel's like uh daniel um where's my flags i said sir a major so-and-so made me oh he did he made you take them down well, last time I checked, uh, Lieutenant Colonel outranked Major, so fucking put him back up. <laughs> I was like, yes, sir. So I put him back up. As soon as I'm out of his sight, say, and all back and forth all day. And uh, everywhere we went, you know, it was just like, you know, anytime we came across some other unit, you know, I, I was getting screamed at, yelled at, you know, yes, sir, I'll take him down. Yeah. And then, Daniel, where's my flags? You know, yes, sir, I'll put him back up, you know. Oh, my but, gosh. Uh, but he, he was, he was, he was the best leader, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Robert L. Douthit, um, from Alabama, fearless, amazing, uh, hell of a leader, uh, everything you'd ever expect from a cavalry guy. I mean, he was, he was it. And he was a pilot 
He flew he flew a helicopter. He flew a helicopter like my teenage daughter drives. I mean, he just he could fly that helicopter through a keyhole. I mean, he was amazing and and absolutely, you know, just, you know, rec- recklessly fearless. I mean, he was he was a badass. Um, but he was he was a, an amazing guy to serve under. And uh, you know, we we all had faith that hey, you know, if, if he's at, if he's at the helm, we're good, you know, because yeah. because this is a good leader. Oh, this, this guy was like, he he was uh, he was just too much of a badass to to die. It was like you know, he's he's not going anywhere. Um, and and he, he had me. Funniest thing when I packed the Humvee to put it on the train, he had me go pick up three sets of uniforms from the dry cleaners, and uh, they were super super starch, you know, super crispy, like super heavy heavy starch. And he's like, I want you to pack those in the, in the vehicle. I packed them. I forgot about it. Months later, we're in Iraq and we're there. We hadn't had showers for like, I don't know, almost two months. Nobody had had a shower for almost two months. And, uh, yeah, just combat showers, the the uniform. No, we, no, no, no shower because we had combat showers, just using body wipes and just baby wipes and wiping off or whatever. But we had. We had two one and a half liter bottles a day per soldier ration. Mm. Two one and a half liter bottles of water. That was for shaving, brushing your teeth, and drinking. And if you think about it, three liters of water a day in 24 hours, three liters of water in a desert environment when it's 100 degrees, degrees. that's not enough. Yeah, you need a liter like every 15 minutes. It's not enough. So so I don't know how we, I don't know how we didn't all like dehydrate to death, but, uh, so water was super, super scarce. Nobody had showered. Everybody's uniform was just caked in dust and sweat and sweat and dust and just body. It was just awful. It was yeah. awful, you know. And uh, so they were having a change of command ceremony. The Australian Special Forces had held al-Assad expecting us to come to take it. And uh, they were leaving. They were, they were turning it over to us officially, and they were going back to Australia. So we had a change of command ceremony. And he said, "Yeah, bust out, bust out one of those uh, sets of scr- or sets of uh, uh, you know BDUs." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I forgot about those, you know." So I get him out, you know. He comes out to the change of command ceremony, fresh starch from the dry cleaner, and we're like miles from the nearest village, much less the nearest dry cleaner. <laughs> Everybody's just like, "Where did he? How did?" How did, how did he do that? It's it's impossible. Like he would have had to have had those in the Humvee three months ago when we put them on the trains, and they were. Yeah. And he he had those. Just it was panache, mm-hmm. style, you know. Yeah. And and I mean, he looked like he just you know walked out of the you know walked out of the uh, you know uh, walked out of the squadron on a normal day, um, you know. So and everyone else is just filthy you know right and now but, you don't dare start your uniforms going over there because it picks up on the heat signature i think or something I, yeah you're not supposed to start your uniforms at all it's yeah. a it's a bad yes. idea and yeah. you're not supposed to fly calf flags from your home, yeah. home <laughs> and these and these flags were as big as they were as big as this table these flags were as big as this oh, table. I, know, I know what flags they're you're huge. talking about yeah. they're huge and and Jeez. when we, when you drive they're just like they're just yeah. making all kind of racket. I mean, and they're and they're red and white. I mean, it's like you, yeah. you can't. I mean, they're probably miss them. just like some of the Confederate flags you see hundred miles here a day. And, uh, oh, and yeah. the American flag, hundred yeah. miles away, rather. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these these were super. I'm I'm really surprised that my vehicle did not, you know, get uh, get shot at. Right. Thank so you. no. Yeah. So no. I'm sure there was some bad stories, but I mean, no IUD or IEDs or any. Horror yeah. stories out no, there, mortars no. hitting you or anything. Al Assad was remote. Al Assad was um, northwestern Iraq. It was basically the boonies. Um, it was edging towards Syria, um, but it was out in the middle of nowhere. Um, the nearest town was a little tiny little village where everybody had like five teeth. It was called Baghdadi. It okay. was a tiny little poor village. I felt really bad for those people because they were so poor. They were so, I mean, it was like middle, middle ages poor. They were happy, but they were really, really poor and they were no threat to anybody. They, they, they were as politically unconnected as you could be just right. this tiny little mm-hmm. village. But that was pretty far from where we were even, that was kind of like a, a, a little bit of a drive. And we did dental service for them. We did medical service. We, we took them food and water. We, we helped them a lot, but, um, Al-Assad was Iraq, the Iraqi air force. Uh, it was their best, biggest, most modern air force base. Um, they had an Olympic sized swimming pool. They had, 
an amazing control tower. They had awesome runways. Uh, it was a great base. It was built in the mid eighties, um, uh, by a European company. Uh, mm -hmm. so it was very modern, very nice. Yeah, I was stationed out of Balad, and it was real similar. Olympic sized pool, huge movie yeah. theater with Saddam Hussein's, you know, main base over there. But but we took it over, and uh, and the Australians held it for us to keep the looters out. But the looters had already, by the time the Australian special forces dropped in to protect it, it was looted. There, the crazy thing was they had, you know, you can imagine an Air Force base like Charleston Air Force Base, all the offices. If you walk through every single office on Charleston Air Force Base and did not find one single pin, not one ballpoint pin or felt tip pin or marker, wouldn't that be weird? You'd, yeah. be, you'd, be, you'd be like, where, what are these people right with? They had looted everything down to the light bulbs, all the pins and pencils, paper what? clips. The only thing they left was paper. Hmm. Paper and, uh, and that was it, paper and trash. So the offices had all the paper, um, mostly on the floor, um, but nothing of value. They, they had, they'd even pulled copper wire out of the walls. They'd taken fixtures, uh, you know, the hot and cold handles, right. doorknobs. I mean, this place was looted hard. It was like, it, this place put crackheads to shame. I mean, this, this sounds like a lot, like, uh, when I was in Las Vegas and we were looking at, uh, houses, we, the realtor was showing a lot of, uh, foreclosed houses and you go in the foreclosed houses and same thing. Everything was gutted out of it. The carpets are ripped up. All the appliances are gone. Yeah. Lights, appliances off the Wires ceiling. Wires hanging out. Yeah. yeah. They just took everything. Oh yeah. This place screw was, this bank. I'm taking all this shit off. Here. This place was looted, looted, looted. And the, the Olympic size swimming pool, I didn't go in and see it myself because I didn't want to, but um, I was told the first day we got there, the swimming pool, the water is black Oh! and there was a cow floating in the, and this is an indoor pool. This is an indoor pool, not an outside pool. This is an indoor Olympic size swimming pool. There was a cow, bloated cow just oh. bobbing around in there, but we drained the pool, got the cow out, scrubbed it down, got the proper chemicals sent over, repaired the pump, did everything we had to do. And by the time we left it was crystal clear blue water people were swimming it was yeah. it was wow. back to back to perfect working order um the hospital uh on on the air force base there were bowls of blood still f sitting there um so you know it, it had just the people had just abandoned it they had just left in the middle of procedures there was you know bloody uh, gauze and stuff and i mean it was just looked like a horror movie yeah but it sounds uh, like it but we uh we went in there to, to steal beds because the hospital beds were way more comfortable than cots. Mm -hmm. So we went in there to, uh, to take beds for ourselves. Um, but, um, and I say we, I'm talking about my, uh, my co-driver, the, uh, the driver for the uh, command sergeant major. We were the only two who had our own vehicles. Um, everybody else, when they were driving a vehicle, they were driving it from A to B. They, they couldn't just go where they wanted, but we, it was like our Humvee. We could go wherever we felt we needed to go. Um, and you know, as long as our bosses were happy and we were there when they needed us, it was, it was kind of like our personal, you know, personal, uh, car or whatever, right. uh, which was great because, uh, we could go different to different places and, you know, trade or whatever, um, run errands, get cigarettes, whatever, whatever people needed done, we, we could do it. Yeah. I mean, it sounded like you had a fantastic time, even though it yeah. was a combat zone, it was war and all that kind of stuff, but it's, well, it, where it's we, a good experience. Where, where I was, there was no combat. Um, we drove through combat zones, I guess, to get there. But once we got there, we had three rings of security around Al-Assad. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a, another unit, um, what do we call them, Predator. It's a unit called Predator that did the outer ring. And then we had two other rings. Um, and... Uh, so, I mean, where we were was super safe. I mean, it was quiet. There, nobody could get close enough to mortar us. Right. Um, even if they wanted to, there was no cover. It was desert all around. You could be seen coming from miles away. We could, we could put the binoculars up and pretty much see Syria almost. It was like, it was just the, 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 you know, the, the land's mm -hmm. so flat. It's like, you know, um, so there was really no threat to us at all, uh, out there. Um, which was nice. I mean, it was, it was it was comfortable walking around because you're like, well, you know, we're in a good spot. We're, we're out in the boondocks. You right. Know? Yeah. It's just the opposite of my experience with blood. I mean, they nicknamed it Mortar Reederville because okay. just all the mortars that we got just on a daily basis coming in. That's gotta be nerve wracking. Yeah. It was very nerve wracking. The sirens would go off in the middle of the night and you jump out your cot and get on the floor and put okay. your head gear on and your flak vest and all that stuff. I, I bet you, I bet you jumped out of your cot and got on the floor even when it wasn't happening occasionally, just cause you think it's happening. Yeah. Like you, like True. a dream. Like, yeah. 
Yeah. It probably was very scary. Your anxiety level was probably uh, through the roof. Big time. How long were you there? Uh, just six months. I mean, I say just six months. But yeah, yeah. it's pretty it's freaking long. Long enough. Yeah. Yeah. Long enough. And what was that? 2006. Mm. Wow. So we're kind of still in the thick of it at yeah. that point. I mean, still are, but... But they've uh, they've shut that base down now. But but it was big time. And the pool, same thing. They they redid the pool, and it was the best thing on the base. I mean, six yeah. o'clock rolled around. I was at the pool every single day, taking a break from all the mass casualties. Cause I worked in the hospital. Okay. So taking a break from all the mass casualties coming in, all the war and the blood and oh, guts man. and all this kind of stuff. And you go take a break and yeah. de-stress. Yeah, pool's a great place to uh, get away from it all. Yeah. And now you're at the VA, so I'm sure you talk to a lot of those guys, and you, you guys trade yeah. stories. I'm sure you hear some wild stuff over there. My my tour is uh is is still ongoing. It's it seems like uh I you know mentally I'm really not away from it because because I have such an immersion there at work and and talk to guys all the time who were at Balad, who were at Biap, who were at Baghdad uh, International. I mean just. Mm-hmm. All the places, all the names, uh, you know, they, they just keep coming up and, and the uh, the guys coming in, the vets coming in, I should, I should say guys and gals, uh, the, the men and women coming in, um, you know, so many of them uh, are, you know, younger and younger and they're just getting out and, you know, they were there, but they were there in, you know, you know, 2015 or 2013 or so, you know, it's, it's, it's still ongoing in the world. It's still ongoing with with the veterans and of course they're coming in and sharing their stories with me. And so it kind of keeps it alive for me. So in a way, mentally I'm, I'm, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, still, still going on. Um, but it, you know, it never was a bad thing for me. Like I, I, I never had any bad experiences. I never had any traumatic incidents. Um, I, I came back with all my fingers and toes I never, I never uh, lost any friends, um, you know. Uh, so I had, a, I had a lucky experience. Yeah, I, you know, I, sure. I have no, I have no negative uh, repercussions. I don't have bad dreams, you know. It doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm glad I went. I'm glad I came back. Um, it gives you a whole but, new perspective when you oh, come yeah. back. Oh yeah, I appreciate I mean, the, I appreciate the stuff the that you used to think was such a big deal when you, when you come back, it's like ah. I appreciate <laughs> that, man. I've been in war. Well, I, I appreciate just being in the continental United States. Just, just the safety and security and the rights and privileges, and just just being in the home country. Uh, oh my gosh! Like when we came back, that was like, uh, yeah. you talk you're about like, uh, you're so glad to be back in like America. Celebrities. Well, you just you're glad to be back in America. You're no, like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm back in this modern country with with you know rule of law and 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 you know it's just this is really a great place to live and when you see how other people live in other parts of the world and you compare it apples to apples you're like man Somerville is fantastic man (laughs) dude because there's some neighborhoods in in Baghdad that are just rough I mean and and they don't have rights and privileges and expectations of freedoms and they're living day to day and hand to mouth and, you know, the violence and, and my God, there's a whole nother country invaded them and they have to deal with that. And, you know, I mean, right. but, we, we talked about another gosh. podcast about how, you know, some people never even leave Somerville their entire lives. They stay right here and they don't get that perspective that you're talking about. I'm glad I got that perspective. If for nothing else, I'm just glad I got to see a part of the world that I consider to be not nearly as good or, or, or nice or, safe or you know i mean just just getting to live there for a while and see and see the locals um and you know see like you know dirty faces and right. dirty dirty clothes and uh you know children you know bathing in this little what i would call a ditch uh, i'm sure they would call it a stream or a river but to me it looked like a, a muddy ditch yeah and then there's livestock crossing you know 30 feet up the up the waterway like livestock crossing and i'm like wait a right. second you know that water's coming down to you and you're pouring it over your head you know that's 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 you know they're just just the you know just the dirtiness and the nastiness and the the primitive conditions you know I, oh my gosh i mean to live like that your whole life i can't imagine you know i mean we're so yeah. spoiled but here. you know mm-hmm. they don't know any different though right right so that's their life to them if they could come over here for a month and then they had to go back they would be bummed out yeah they, they for would sure. they would really be bummed out 100 percent so during all this time, married, I know you mentioned a couple kids, or at least one kid, yeah, I think you mentioned, I, right? So. I got married and uh, had two beautiful children, a boy and a girl, um, Garrett and Morgan. My son is uh, fixing to be uh, 
21 here uh, in July, and uh, my daughter is 16, going on 25. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, she's a sophomore at Ashley Ridge High School, and um, great kids, uh, couldn't ask for more. Uh, my wife is deceased. Um, we divorced, and uh, and then she uh, passed away in uh, 2015. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, we were, we were divorced when that happened. Um, but yeah, I, I've got sole custody of the kids back in '05, and uh, during the divorce, I became single dad, and uh, you know, went to Trident, got a got a job skill, got a job, um, and I've been uh, with the help of my parents. Um, you know, we 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 the three of us, uh, you know, raised them up, and now my son's at UGA, and uh, he's uh, majoring in international affairs. He wants to go into politics. He's working on a local uh, uh, Congress race. Um, so no aspirations for the military for either one of them? No, or? no, neither one of them are interested. I, I you know, I've, I've tried to steer them both that way as far as, you know, just, hey, just, just do one enlistment. Get that GI Bill money, you know. It's a good, oh, yeah. it's, oh, it's, 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 it's good for that. And it's also just, you know, it's good for uh, help getting you hired. It's good for your resume. A lot of employers see that and they say, hey, you know, you may not have experience, but you know you're trainable you know you, yeah you've proven you, that you can take direction you know yeah you learn you learn so many skills absolutely time management and just uh, public speaking discipline yeah. um just so many things yeah. that you, you got to have your head I, on i believe everybody should have to do a couple years after they get out of high school i agree you, you gotta have i, your, I didn't you absolutely. gotta have your head and i mean on just straight. to get back to our country in general just as you know we all live here let's all you know do our part and do our share and 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 be a citizen soldier it would be as well as a soldier it would be a completely different country if that was the case if every young person had to do two years within a decade this whole country would be so different i mean because it really does open your eyes to the fact that what we have here is not uh carved in stone it's not it's not guaranteed it's not the way everyone else lives right and there are people out there uh working hard day in and day out to ensure that we have this cushy nice lifestyle and uh you know it, it it's it's really mind-blowing when you think about it because there's a lot of people doing a lot of things 24 7 uh to give us this comfort that we have you know uh, or yeah. to allow us to keep this comfort that we have mm -hmm. um and uh you know it's there's a uh, there's a sign at the va that says um i think it, i don't want to get it wrong i think it says uh the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a cool sign because, uh, you know, we, we, we really, you know, can't let our guard down or else we probably would lose the lifestyle we have. I mean, the country would be, uh, you know, a lot different if we, if we sort of got slack and, you know, yeah, just, it's kind of a necessary evil. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Like that. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of people in the world who I think are jealous. Um, when it comes down to it, they can they can you know they can wrap their they can wrap it up in all kinds of ideological differences. But I, I really think it boils down to just good old fashioned jealousy. You know, you got it too good, and we don't have it that good. And there must be you must have done something immoral or illegal to get it that good. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna find a way to come up with the right words to to justify that gut feeling. And I, I think a lot of people in the world, a lot of countries in the world, they're just downright jealous. They, they say, you know, you, you guys have found something uh, that we wish we could have, but we, you know, we, we can't have it. And, and so we're going to blame you. You must be a bad, you must be bad people to have it so good, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and we can't convince them that's not the truth. So we just kind of have to protect what we have and say, hey, look, you know, you, you, can, you can dislike us, but you're not going to take away what we have. Yeah. You know? Well, we've been... There are plenty of trials and tribulations when it comes to what we have and stuff that we worked for and fought for. I mean, it hasn't been an easy road, and we're still such a baby country. It's crazy. Oh, and in, in relationship to other empires, yeah. I mean, our empire is tiny. It's a tiny fraction. Yeah. I think China's had seven dark ages since since China started. They've had seven dark ages and come out of seven dark ages. and And, you know, I mean... America's, you know, not, we, yeah, not even three hundred years old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very small. I mean, you got you know the Romans and the Mayans and all the uh, the, the Mongols. I mean, just yeah. so many great people that they fell. 
they, they put their guard down or whatever. I don't know. I'm not a historian or anything, but, but yeah. Me either. It doesn't we're, last we're, long. We're, we're really, uh, it's funny, but we're really, um, we really are just new Europe. Um, you know, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, right. we're, we're still so young as America that, that I, you know, we, we like to say we're America and we're unique and different and we're our own thing. And we are. But really, we're New Germany, New England, New, uh, new Ireland, New, mm-hmm. you know, basically, you know, Europe just said, hey, prime property and lots of space and, you know, plenty of resources. And so, you know, the vast majority of our culture is still just a transplant. I mean, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, which is why it's so nice when you get to go to other places in the country that have a larger crowd of people. Like, um, I know California, you get a lot of more uh, Asian mixture of people that are coming there. And so when you can go over there, oh, I'm over here talking about California. I've never been over there. But I've got family. No, but you're absolutely live. right. Okay. Hawaii. I mean, it's it's Pacific. So I mean, those people yes. ventured over from that side. You know. I mean, it's it's, it's totally different. Yeah. Which is one of the yeah. reasons, and I've said this many times before, like going to Universal Studios in like Florida, for instance. Although that is a very commercial adventure to do or trip, it's a melting pot of people, and it's so much fun for me to look around. And you can get all like so many people that I just sit back and from fashion to mannerisms to how they talk what they get excited for how they it's, everything is so interesting and I, I absolutely love it so i would say yeah i mean a lot of the part is like a transfer of europe and it's so nice to get to a point where you can get the rest of the world in our country it's really cool and they come they want to come i mean that we you know tourism wise we we get people from everywhere i mean every, everybody wants to come here at some point if you're if you're a world traveler right either I mean, legally or illegally well here 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 and here and like you know a few other a few other countries i think kind of have that like i think paris i think you know internationally people everyone wants to go to paris at one point they want to see the eiffel tower they want to they want to check out paris guilty um and and you know maybe maybe even some other big stops in europe but uh <clears throat> but not everyone wants to go to australia I mean, a lot of people do, but not not really everybody. I mean, it's but but everyone wants to come to America. Everyone wants to come here and and check out New York and Texas. And I mean, we, we've really got so many different you know uh, cultures going on within the continental forty eight. That I mean, God, you could you could come here and you know do an entire junket just in the southeast, and then come back and do the northwest, and then come back right. and do Maine, and then you know, I mean, it's 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 almost like you know six or seven small countries. Yeah, very put, similar put conversation together. that we had a previous couple of Richard, right? No, that was Gordon. Was it Gordon? Oh, I think it was Gordon. Dang it. Or maybe it might have been Richard. Because Richard know. is We've had so many interesting conversations. Traveled all over the continent. I think it was Richard. Several You're right. times, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Why, why waste all that money and get on a plane and go to Paris when you could just go right over to Chicago or go to California? Well, I, you and know, be a totally never, different lifestyle than what we got here in Somerville. I've never seen... A lot of places in the U.S. I mean, there's plenty of places I haven't been that I would like to go. Um, yeah, I and, think I was uh, adding up the other day after we talked about. it. I think I've after Jan, Janet was on, she said she's been to 45 states. Oh, don't quote th- me on. I don't. I think know. it was 45, and she's trying to get to all 50. Obviously, and I think I added it up. I've done 31 so far. So wow, I'm getting there. And I just <laughs> had, just five. added just added Colorado to the list this past weekend. <laughs> so. And they're all fantastic places. It's so much different lifestyles and different, uh, just topography, you know, just yeah. f- from the desert to the mountains, to snow, to beaches, to rivers, whatever. I mean, it's just so much out there to see. Yeah. Get out of Somerville. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, on that note. Yeah. We got empty time. glasses. We got one more beer. Moving on. Do you want to switch to the next glassware? Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. We'll pick up these glasses. And this is a 16 ounce glass. I mean, 16 ounce can. So if we want to just split that up, but I've got two of them. We could do two of them. Just split the one. It's up to you guys. Well, why don't we split the one? And if we like it, we can. Yeah. Top it off. We got another one if That's we want to do another one. Well, what if we... we don't like it, oh. we got a degree over here. It's got a bachelor's degree. <laughs> interdisciplinary. <laughs> interdisciplinary <laughs> studies. Interdisciplinary studies. What are we drinking, Brian? We are drinking. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, thank you. We're drinking Church Lady by Reverie Brewing Company, uh, downtown Charleston. It's an extra special strong bitter. Isn't that special? Isn't that special? <laughs> I know, made, right? made by Satan himself. 
I bet that just makes your naughty parts tingly, doesn't it, Brian? That's right. Like this beer. A lot of people are going to get lost on that, I think. They're not going <laughs> to understand the reference. What, the Made by Satan? No, just church lady in general. Oh. I said, I said, a little more I said it's going to make uh, Brian's naughty parts all tingly. They are the yeah. naughty parts, are they not? <laughs> it's a beautiful can. Wow. I'm going to let you read the back of it, Caleb, when you get a second. Uh, 6.3% alco- alcohol. There's, again, no description on untapped on this one. I don't know why, but... You ready? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> We're tossing one out for our brewing blokes across the pond with this extra special bitter amber. Light-bodied, assertively bitter, and full of English yeast character that makes this beer a smashing example. Isn't that special? There you go. I like it. <laughs> it's a fantastic can. <laughs> it really is funny. I thought she had an upside-down cross at first, but she does not. There is a mouth and a tongue sticking out in the can, though. Hmm. Which is nice. Very interesting. All right. I'm catching that yeast. It's. Oh, yeah, for sure. Inter- De- definitely in English. Interesting <laughs> nose. <laughs> well, I like this toast to, uh, to the military. Yeah. And, and to yeah. the VA as well. Yeah, to absolutely. VA. To fallen comrades. Yes. Mm. Wow. That's refreshing. Very nice. Malty. Little yeah. sweetness. Not too bitter. It's not, actually. It's kind of uh, some cookie it's in very there, complex. maybe biscuits. Yeah. You do get the, the biscuity oats. But it's kind of sour. It's, it's kind there of, is a little twinge to it at the it's end. It's kind of sour at the end, but it, it's nice. It's it's a Yeah. Reverie it, does good stuff down there. And their cans are always fantastic. They just won a bunch of awards, actually. I, I follow them on Facebook, and they... Where they just come back from? Mm, like Oregon that. or Colorado or California? Some competition they went to, and they brought back mm. a bunch of gold medals for really like five or six of them. I have to look it up. And that's uh, one of the most sure. interesting, unique beers I think I've had. That's that's, well, good. that's very different. I've, it's it's definitely got a what I would call a, a high hop note, but it's not really hops. It's more of a sour, right? But it's got that similar piney sharpness to it but only at the end it's like you, you it, yeah it, i definitely get that sourness that you're talking about and it's not sour it's, it's just a twinge of yeah. sour but just a hint good sour though like a, yeah like a sour and you had beer. mentioned a, a scotch ale and I, I had one in mind that i was yeah. going to get and uh, i saw this one uh today when i was out and i said ah, that's an interesting can it kind of fits similar style i mean it's not scotch but it's english yeah. so I've, uh, it's in kind of the same area over there bellhaven scottish ale was is my favorite and they stopped selling it in georgia for a long time there was some kind of some kind of legal hubbub about it, but uh, if you ever get a chance to try Bellhaven Scottish Ale, I believe I have. I, I, it's in a sixteen ounce can like that too. I right? think so. Yeah, and it is fantastic. I mean, that yeah, is, we'll write that down. That is one I'll of my favorite too. beers. Bellhaven. Bellhaven Scottish, Scottish Ale. Does and, Bellhaven make anything else? Are they known for anything else? Because I've never heard of that. Or yeah, I mean, it's a whole brewery. What? So, I'm not sure. But I don't is know. That, is that a staple? Up? Is that right. one of the? I don't know. I, I I don't know anything about. The company or the brewery. I, I've never seen any, any other product by them. That was the only the only beer I ever I ever saw from them. I used to get it at Jack's Liquor Store on Roswell Road in Atlanta. What an awesome name for a out road! Of, out of Scotland. Roswell Road. <laughs> and uh, that was that was that was actually a heck of a road. Um, that was there was a lot on that road. It went and it went all the way to Roswell. It went all the way to Roswell, Georgia. I was going to ask how it was interconnected there. <clears throat> it went all. It drove. It it was a two lane originally that just went from Atlanta straight to Roswell and uh, Roswell really became a, a real hip community sort of like Somerville is to Charleston um, okay Atlanta Atlanta you know was obviously big and well known and then Somerville was kind of you know 30 minutes away and sort of small and you know out of out of the city um, and Roswell was even smaller and and, and a little further um, but as the prices in Atlanta went up um, people kept inching out and they found that little community and uh it became a real real hipster hipster kind of place <laughs> and then people say walter is gonna gonna do that someday i don't really? know you think walter <laughs> i don't know cottageville before walter i don't know but people yeah. people have said that to me before but then i've also heard uh that there's a lot of gang stuff going on in walter and 
I'm sure that would. I could see that. I'm sure that would drive you away. You would being in a gang. That yeah. would. <laughs> well, I used to drive through there uh, for about eight years or six and a half years. I'm sorry. I, I was down in Valdosta, Georgia, at uh, Moody Air Force Base down there, and we would drive back through Walterboro to come back to see my parents and my ex-wife's parents. But I was shocked when I was told about it. I, I, was, I was like, really, gang activity? And I was like, yeah, we didn't want to stop. I was like, why? Why? What? What? what you know. I always thought gangs had to have like a, a, a pretty good sized city or metropolis to, to work out of. I, I figured Walterboro was so small and quaint that like what 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 are the gangs doing? What 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 are they? How are they surviving? What are they? How are they making money? You know? Yeah, I don't know. Sorry, Walterboro, if we're yeah. if we're misstepping here, but who knows? I we, we're not for sure. When I worked at the law firm as a courier, I went to Walterboro all the time. Yeah, and I never got any of that. I, the gangs. Threw me off. I did not see that coming whatsoever. It was just very, like you said, quaint. It's very quiet. Yeah. It was just, I would go around. Most of the buildings are run down, well, but I, it's not. I, scary wouldn't have, at I wouldn't all. have said anything if it had only been one person one time. But I've I've heard several wow. stories from several people over the past five, six, seven years, and I every time I was incredulous, like really, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah there's there's a lot of shootings, there's a lot of. A lot of drive bys probably, and probably drug, drug. Oh yeah, it's gotta be drugs. Yeah, so it's gang. It's gotta be know, drugs. It's maybe drugs. It's maybe Walter Burrow, like a in between city connector for a lot of other places. Well, it's right off the interstate, so you come okay. straight up from Miami and those places, and it's probably a good like drop Florence, off point. Florence, South Carolina, is uh, on I I ninety five, and uh, the nickname for Florence is Flow Town, yeah, because drugs flow through Florence. No idea. Yeah, yeah, there's a seedy underbelly to uh, a lot of the uh, corridors. You know, these 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 north south, uh, Miami to New York. You know, anything between Miami and New York, if it's on the if it's on the drug highway, there's you know there's there's a lot of to the story. Even in places like Florence, because you know, to me, Florence, when I first heard about it, I said, wait, the Walmart doesn't sell anything on Sundays except food until noon. I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, it offends people's religious sensibilities to conduct commerce yeah. on the Sabbath <clears throat> unless it's food. They'll sell you right. food on Sunday morning, but you can't buy deodorant or vitamins or razors. And then at noon, they say, okay, yeah. we've observed enough of the day. You can now purchase your socks and your you know, gardening supplies. Yeah. And I, I, I was shocked when I heard that. And this was a few years back. My brother lived there. I said, Walmart? A few years back? Yeah, yeah. Really? I yeah. was going to say, it was like that here forever. Really? You know, you, you, nothing what? even opened until noon on a Sunday. Wow. Well, th- yeah, okay. That makes yeah. sense. But and you couldn't buy beer here on Sunday. Yeah, you couldn't buy beer But you can buy beer time. here now on Sunday, which is... You yeah. sure can. Well, speaking which of beer, I looked this up. So, Bellhaven uh, Brewery out of Dunbar, Scotland, one of the oldest regional breweries in Scotland with a commercial brewing history documented back to 1719. Mm. Wow. Um... Belleville, Bell, Bellhaven Brewery had, uh, was family owned until 1984 and since then has been subject to continual investment and more recently the addition of a new brew house in 2011. But yeah, they got a uh, bunch of cask ales, they got an IPA, uh, oh, wow. We Heavy, um, Bellhaven Best. I mean, there's a ton of beers that they do over there. So, Yeah, that Scottish ale really stands out in my mind of of all the beers I've ever had. I've, I've That one got like a big check mark. I put that in the middle note when I, and I haven't seen it in many years. I I don't know where to get it. I guess yeah. Total Wine might have it. Yeah, they probably would. They do a lot of imported stuff over there, but still yeah. yet to go down to Total Wine. Oh my gosh, dude! <laughs> be be prepared to spend an hour just walking up and down the beer aisles and and with your with your mouth yeah. agape because oh, yeah. it, it's it's like you 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 just keep asking yourself like how is it possible that there's all these beers in the world that I never knew about, you know, and they're all here and they're half of them are cold. They're like in refrigeration. They're ready to go. It's like, it's amazing. (laughs) It is amazing. That is, that store blows me away. Every time I go in there, I'm just, I'm like, you know, you guys have everything, literally everything, you know, they even have cigars. West Ashley or Mount Pleasant? West Ashley. West Ashley. Ashley. Mount Pleasant is a bottles, similar type store, but it's just a different brand, different name. But the beer selection at oh my gosh! Well, I I, I went there specifically for a Freehouse Brewery product, mm. and uh, I will give a shameless plug for Freehouse Brewery. Oh yeah! Uh, I love love their beer, and I went to Total Wine hoping to find some uh, big bottles of their um, Hoodoo Imperial Stout. Oh, barely choice! Oh my gosh! And yes. I, 
when I when I did the recording for the album the first day, I bought two big bottles to take with to give to share with the guys, um, you know, at some point in this session. And uh, neither one of them had ever tried Hoodoo Imperial Stout, and uh, they they both were believers. They were like, "Man, this is really good. <laughs> Super good. It really is." Did it's, you have the barrel age or just a regular version? The barrel age. Yeah, the barrel yeah. age is the bomb. Yeah, yeah. you you went big. That's for sure. I had two big bottles. They were like, uh, I think they were, I don't know, like eleven dollars a piece or something. That's but not uh, bad at all. But they no, were the big good. they were the big bottles, and uh, they were absolutely delicious, worth every penny. Freehouse Brewery. Um, Arthur is the owner, and uh, he's a great guy. Uh, he makes fantastic beer. Nice, nice, nice fellow to talk to. Just a good guy. Um, uh, you know, I think he's a single dad as well. We've we've had a few cigars and talked, and he's still the main master brewer there, right? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but he's uh, he's he's an he's an interesting guy because he I think he used to be a corporate lawyer. Hmm. And uh, I said I said uh, why'd you get out of corporate law to brew beer? And he kind of looked at me like. What would you rather do? And I said, <laughs> yeah. "You're right. No, no, there is no question. You know, of course, you know, cor- <laughs> corporate law or brew beer. Well, of course, you'd rather brew beer, right? And I guess some people would rather do corporate law, but it sounds kind of dry. Yeah, yeah, I would. No, thank you. Yeah. I mean, might yeah. be lucrative, but and and to some people it might be fascinating. Some people might just that might be their cup of tea. They, they might need pro- it up. They might be sitting home right now, you know, writing a brief and being like, "How dare he say that?" Yeah. It's like your passion is music. Law is my life. Which we're going to get to here briefly, shortly. Yeah, what time is it? Yeah, let's talk, let's, talk, let's talk about the album. I'm let's do it. I'm dying to talk about the album. Jump in, man. Let's hear it. All let's right. do it. What we're talking about a lot of interesting, interesting stuff. That's why you're here. So I have been a music nut my whole life. Um, growing up in the 70s, listening to my mom and dad's records. Best decade in the world for you know what was being put out. Were they musicians at all? No. Well, my dad was. My dad was trombone player. Um, okay. And uh, he uh, and he was a big uh, music fan. He had a huge record collection. He had a reel to reel tape deck, and uh, you know, always playing good stuff. And uh, I remember uh, just always hearing the best music. You know, Paul Simon, The Beatles, just great stuff. And uh, you know, always loved it. Never played an instrument though. And then uh, got to college, and of course. You know, part of moving into the dorm in college, at least in 1987, was you know everybody had an acoustic guitar. That was the thing, and I think it still is. I think it's. I think it is. I think it still well, I is. I know it is. Um, so, <laughs> so I, you know, I, I remember meeting some guys on the hall who played acoustic guitar, and I was like, well, these are cool guys, and they play songs that I like, and they like the kind of music I like, so I'll hang out with them, and um, you know, they they say, yeah, you should, you should, you know, you should try to. Play. Oh, I don't play, you know. And they're, oh, they put it in my hand. They're like, oh, put your fingers here, you know, do this, do. This. And before I knew it, I was actually like, oh, I, I can play a few chords. This is cool, you know. And I kind of got the bug, and you know, but went home for Christmas break and asked Santa Claus for an acoustic guitar. Yeah. And, you know, got got one. Took it back to college with me, all excited, my brand new acoustic, you know. And hey, guys, look what I got, you know. And, and uh, just played and played and played and uh, never had any lessons. Never never got anything but instruction from friends. Um, and uh, always played you know, songs I liked, I always played cover songs. And, um, I went out to, uh, long story short, I went out to Allendale Green, uh, back in January. I think it was January 30th or Yeah, tw- you were 29th. telling me about this place. So I need to get yeah. out there. You've never been? Never been. Awesome. Wednesday what? night barn jam. Yeah. yeah. 6 to 10 p.m., five bucks a head to get in, free parking, food uh, is sold there, uh, bring your own, bring your own booze, bring your own beverages. Um, they always have four or five bands, four or five acts. Um, great music. The guy who owns it, uh, Dr. Eddie White, amazing guy, um, super nice. Um, he's there every time. He's introducing bands. He's walking around, working the crowd, talking to people, um, super involved. Um, can't say enough good about Allendale Green, which is where I'm having my first uh, real gig, my first show, uh, June 13th at 6 p.m. I'll be there. June thirteenth, six p.m. It's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday night barn jam. I'm the, I'm kicking it off. So. It's my son's birthday. Ah, maybe I'll celebrate there. It's an awesome place. <laughs> awesome place. The sound is good. That they have a soundboard um, in a little covered shed that you know sits back in the center, you know, away from the stage, and they they run professional sound out there. I mean, it sounds fantastic. You could record a live album out there if you wanted to. Nice. Um, 
it's it's fantastic but anyway i'm out there in january the first time i've ever been out there it was like 28 degrees freezing cold uh they have a bunch of campfires going still 150 people out there hmm. i was i was shocked i was like man that's a lot of people so um i met this couple and uh they were like, oh, you ever been out here before? I said, no, it's my first time. They said, oh, man, well, we come out here all the time. We, we come out here every Wednesday. We love this place. Um, you know, you, you're you going to love it, too. And they said, you know, do you do you play? Do you sing? I said, yeah, I, I'm, you know, new singer, songwriter, kind of just started writing originals. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. You know, that's great. You should play here. I said, I would love to. I said, that, that's kind of why I came out. I was sort of scouting it out as a potential place to play. They said, well, we should introduce you to the owner. And I said, oh, okay, right, that would be wonderful. You know, I, I didn't want to, you know, expect anything. I didn't want to push it. I just said, oh, that'd be great. So we talked about other stuff, and we're watching the bands, and then they spot him, and they're like, oh, there he is. Come on, come on, let's go over. I was like, okay. So we walk over there, and this couple, I don't, and honestly, I don't even remember their names at this point. They had introduced themselves as like Brad and Jenna, but I, I at this point, I couldn't have even told you what their names were. I just yeah. slipped my mind. I, I mean, we, and they're like, <clears throat> they're like, Eddie, Eddie. This is Ron. He's a singer songwriter. He's amazing. <laughs> and I'm I looked at them I looked at them like, Are you kidding me? You don't know me. You don't know that you don't even know if I'm lying when I say I sing and play. How, how can you do how can you lie to this man and tell him that I'm amazing? You've never heard me. You don't know. And now he's looking at me like, Who are you? And he looks at them, he knows them, and they're like, You gotta book him, Eddie. You gotta get him out here. And he's like, oh, okay, all right, well, get my business card, contact me, we'll talk. I said, well, thank, nice to meet you, sir, thank you, you know. And I was thinking, wow, what a plug, you know, these guys are going to bat for me, like vouching for me, they don't even know. So I said, man, I, you know, I need to follow through with this, this is a, this is a crack in the door here. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, before I contact him, I need to get my stuff together, I need to uh, get some demo tracks to send him, because he's probably a little incredulous he's probably going to be like okay i've never seen you before in my life all of a sudden this couple's coming up and telling me to book you let me at least hear what you do you know so i know you're not awful so i said i need to get in the studio so i called found a studio found hybrid audio solutions fantastic studio booked a slot i told him i said i want to do a six song demo for the purpose of you know giving it to booking agents or to giving it to clubs so they can hear what i do and my real purpose was to give it to um, Dr. Eddie White and uh, so that he could say, oh, okay, yeah, all right, I'll book you. So I went out there the next week. I saw him again. I said, hey, uh, just to let you know, I, don't, I didn't contact you because I don't have any demo tracks to send you yet, but I have, I have a studio time booked. I'm going to be getting them soon, and I'll send them to you as soon as I get them. And he looks at me really hard. He kind of like, <laughs> kind of like just looks at me for a minute like, you don't have any demo tracks. Oh my gosh. But you're going in the studio so that you can give me demo tracks. And I've already agreed to book you. Kind of that look on his face like this is not making much sense because I thought you were amazing. And if you were amazing, you'd have like a portfolio. Work. You'd of some have work. Sort. Yeah. yeah. So he just kind of looks at me real hard, you know, like incredulously. And, and I'm just looking back at him like. <laughs> You know, I'm going to the studio. I'm going to have it. And he goes, you know what? Don't send me any demo tracks. I don't, you don't need to do that. Just, just contact me. I'll book you. I said, okay, great. Thank you. So I, I was like, I don't know how this is going to work. So I, I contact him. He emails me back. He says, congratulations, June 13th, six o'clock. You're in. And by the way, good luck in the studio. I said, uh-huh. I said, man, this is fantastic. Now I have a gig. I don't even have demo tracks. So told the studio i wanted to do six songs for a glorified demo basically and they said okay six hour slot that should be plenty of time 30 minutes to set up four and a half hours to record an hour to um mix and master you'll walk out with a cd you'll walk out with your six six songs and uh in it from the time and it's just you just me just you just a performance style recording like you know 1930s you go into the room Heck sit, yeah, sit down on the stool they slip the microphone through a hole in the wall and when they're ready to record, they knock on the wall and you start playing. And it's literally cutting a record on the other room behind the wall. It's as you're nice. playing, it's actually cutting the record. That's that's how they used to do it. And it was one take. And mm-hmm. if you messed it up, that was it. The, the record literally went off and got shattered. And we put a <laughs> put a virgin vinyl record on and 
okay, so those recordings were done in one, two, maybe three takes. Um, they didn't have the luxury of, you know, 50 takes or 60 takes or right. whatever. There was no overdubbing. It was, it was A to B all at one, one shot. So that's, that's what I was going to do. Um, and, uh, in the meantime, I kept writing songs and, uh, I said, gosh, you know, six songs has now become seven and now it's eight and now it's nine. And by the time I went in, I had 10 original songs and I said, dang, you know, this, why am I doing a demo? I should do an album. Because the only difference between a demo and an album is how you present it. Um, as long as you have at least four tracks uh, totaling at least 28 minutes, then technically that's an album. Okay. Um, and I said, well, I've got 10 songs that are going to be well over 30 minutes. That's an album. Um, and if I do the art and the packaging and the presentation, then it's an album. Now, are these all songs you just came up with? Or are these songs you've had in your pocket for no, a while? No, I, 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 I would... You know, it's funny, I, I, I've been playing since 87, and I've been playing covers ever since 87, and, and just happy playing covers, just just thrilled to play other people's stuff. Love playing Neil Young, love playing James Taylor, love playing, um, you know, the band. And I can sense that in your music, for just sure. the band, any, any, any classic rock, 60s, 70s, just love playing other people's stuff. Never had the desire to write. And I was at the Ice House one night after playing the open mic, and a guy named Devin came up to me, scotch and water in his hand, probably about two and a half sheets of the wind. And, and he said, he said, Hey, Hey, yeah, and that kind of, Hey, yeah. And I said, Hey, Hey Devin. He goes, mm, let me ask you something. I said, ask away. He says, I've seen you play here before. I've seen you play here several times. You're pretty good. I said, well, thank you. He said, you're, you're really good. You're good how come you don't ever do your originals? And I said, because I don't have any. He starts laughing. He's like, oh, that's so good. That's so funny, man. He's like, no, really, why don't you play your originals? I said, I don't have any. And then he gets all serious. He's like, what? He's like, we've talked a bunch of times, man. You've, you've done stuff in your life. You hitchhiked to California and back. You know, you've been in other parts of the world. You know, you, your wife was a heroin addict. You know, you've, you've got you've got material, man. Why, why don't you write? And I said, well, I, I guess I was always just scared to write. I, I was scared I'd fail. I was scared I'd not be good at it. And then he gets like lecturing me. He's like, well, well shame on you, man. Shame on you. Hmm. And I said, whoa, 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 hold up, Devin. What do you mean shame on me? Hold on now. I've, I've not done anything wrong here. And he's like, no, you have, man. You're holding back from the world. You're, you're selfish. You're keeping it all inside. You're not sharing your gift, man. You have a gift and you're not sharing it. And that's bullshit. I call bullshit on you, man. That's fucked up. Heck yeah, hmm. And I'm like, I walk away like, oh, man, I just got, I just got chewed out, you know, like, God, I, he's right, you know. And then I shook it off. I'm like, no, 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 <clears throat> no, no, no. Devin's just means well, but he's, he's, the scotch is talking and, and, you know, it's kind of that, like, I'm your buddy and now I'm angry at you, you know, alcohol kind of thing. So I blew it off. With that. I completely just blew it off. I was like, eh, eh, forget him, forget him, whatever. I'm happy doing covers. I don't need to write. It kept eating at me day after day. It kept coming back to me. The conversation would play in my head and I kept thinking about it and I said, why, why don't I write? Is it just fear? Is it just fear of failing? Is it just fear of not being good? Because if that's it, I can I can try and if it doesn't work out I'm I'm no worse off I'm mm -hmm. I'm still playing covers I'm still happy, and he has a point you know I do have something to say I do have experience I do have a rich life, I mean I I you know I've done a lot of things and experienced a lot of things and, I mean no more or less than any other songwriter, I mean you know I you know all these other people who write these amazing songs they don't live on another planet, I mean they put their pants on one leg at a time, you know, they, they do the same things I do. Right. They have friends, they go to work. So why not try? So I set about, this is last summer. I set about trying to write a song, set about trying to write a song. And I it took me three months to write one song and it was okay. It was like B minus C plus B minus. It was, it was okay, but I was happy. I was like, I did it. I wrote a song and it, it wasn't bad. And I said, this is great, you know, I'm going to keep at this. And then the next song came in about a month and it was better. It was, and I, and I said, okay, I, I see how this works kind of, you know, this is not, this is not rocket science. Those two didn't make the album? No, 
No, uh, one of them doesn't exist anymore, and one will never see the light of day again. Um, <laughs> because from that point, um, well, when I say one doesn't exist anymore, I cannibalized it for parts. It, it became a, it became a part song. Okay, I, I stole bits and pieces and. Fair enough. So it's still there. It, it still exists. In essence. It still it still exists, but it, uh, it's it's yeah it's 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 like a it's like the 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 uh, the prototype. Um, but um, then <clears throat> about December, this past December, um, I got my new Martin. I ordered a custom Martin. I had the same Yamaha F three ten, uh, one hundred thirty five dollar acoustic for thirteen years. Wow. Um, and I treated it like gold. $130 guitar, nothing special, just a basic beginner guitar with a cardboard type case, you know, flimsy. They call it a hard case, but it's like super flimsy and cheap. Um, and the guitar itself was just just a standard basic dreadnought acoustic guitar, no, no electronics. I uh, kept it for 13 years and I always said, I'm going to keep this guitar until it's holding me back. I'm not going to be the guy who goes out and buys an expensive guitar when he has no reason to do so because he's not that good. Mm. I said, until I'm too good for this instrument, I'm keeping this instrument. And one day I had to admit, I said, you know, this instrument is holding me back. I'm actually better now than this instrument can, can do for me. So I ordered a custom Martin guitar. I went whole hog. Um, I got a, a D 15 M, uh, the D 15 line was, uh, styled after the 1930s guitars, very stripped down, um, very low key, headstock, butterbean tuning pegs, looks like a 1930s guitar, and it's all mahogany. The M stands for mahogany, so D15M mahogany with nice. uh, custom uh, abalone inlay around the sound hole, uh, mother of pearl uh, on the headstock, um, no pick guard, um, special bracing, because I use a lighter gauge string, exactly what I wanted. It came in on December 18th. I picked it up, I went home, and I started playing the guitar, and I swear the people in Nazareth, Pennsylvania, at the Martin factory, put some magic in this guitar. They, they put some, some juju in this guitar, because I started writing oh, just instantly. It just, mm -hmm. songs started just coming, wow. and coming, and coming, and uh, by the time I got in the studio, I had 10 originals, and... Uh, How many did you I mean, have when you were at <clears throat> All Adult? At that point, I had six. That's amazing. Six. Mm -hmm. and, uh, say, what a month! It was. Uh, it was. Yeah, it was like a, a month and a half. Yeah. They came really fast, and then uh, before I went in the studio. Uh, well, the, the funny thing is, I was at Onda the first time when I when I when I met Eddie uh, the first time. It was a full moon. It was a blue moon, and uh, so I decided to record on a full moon. Um, Neil Young used to always record on a full moon. Uh, I don't I don't know why, but he always recorded on a full moon, and I was, Neil Neil is one of my heroes. So I said, you know what? If it's good enough for Neil, it's good enough for me. So I picked March 31st because it was a full moon. Recorded on March 31st. Went back April 10th. Well, when I went back April 10th, I had another song, and uh, so that was 11, and uh, and uh, so they they just and now I have another one. Um, they just keep coming and. Uh, you know, I've I've written a whole album's worth of material since December, um, and I think that they're all really solid and really strong. And uh, I think this album is going to be super uh, special, uh, at least at some point. I think it's going to be. It may be a slow burn, but I think it's going to be appreciated uh, from an artistic standpoint, from a singer song or writer standpoint. I think it's going to be appreciated. Um, uh, quite a lot. I mean, I, I really do. I, and I don't take credit. I'm not pumping my own ego or saying that I'm great or, you know, I, what, look at me. I'm so, I'm so talented. I feel like this is all just a gift from the muse. Like this, like I said, this, this guitar had some magic in it and it, it channeled, it was like an antenna holding this Martin, just like channeled the, you know, the songs from the universe and they just came down to me. And uh, I've always heard singer songwriters say, you know, oh yeah, um, that song took me five minutes to write, you know. Um, and I'm like, how do you do that? How do you write a song in five minutes, you know? But, you know, Neil Young talks about it. He says, it's like you're an antenna and you're channeling. And if you get into the right space in your head, in your, in your, in your spirit, it can come to you. And when it comes to you, it's 
it's it's coming to you and through you. It's not from you. <clears throat> oh, I totally understand. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I was going to say you probably feel that exact same way. Singer songwriters the don't, art. don't create it. They yeah. they just interpret it or they just allow it to have a, a physical presence. That's <clears throat> the moment where you lose all sense of reality aside from that one thing that you are focusing on. Yeah, it's you like become part five of five hours just disappears, gone. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, I have no idea. You become part of it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You lose yourself in that moment. And I, you know, I I can't even. You know, I, I can remember bits and pieces like um, I was I, I had a, a Wednesday. I, I was sitting down on Wednesday morning. I wanted I wanted to write. I, I was feeling like I want to write. I want to write. I don't know what I want to write about. I just but I know I feel like I'm in that mood. But I don't I don't have a subject. I don't have a feeling. I don't have an emotion. I don't yeah. know what topic to. So I just sat down with my guitar and I have a, a candle with uh, three wicks and uh I lit all three wicks and I set the candle there and I'm just looking at this three wick candle and uh, a friend of mine at work had given me a copy of Highway 61 Revisited on vinyl and it's the Australian version and I'm sitting there just looking at this album cover of Bob Dylan just like man that guy could write some songs you know and uh, I'm sitting there and I'm like just playing around with words and and I'm like well you know a good starting point is is to just you know sing about what you see or sing about what you're thinking at the moment and maybe something will come of it maybe maybe nothing will and uh i'm looking at the bob dylan album cover and, and uh one of the greatest songs is Do- um, ballad of a thin man and uh i said you know i've always i've always liked the title of that song ballad of a thin man it's just a weird kind of thing like you know why would you write a ballad about a thin man it's it's kind of <laughs> nonsensical but i said to myself you know the thin man has his ballad Oddly enough, why why does the thin man have his ballad? I don't know. And then I said, you know, let me try that. So I said, the thin man <clears throat> has his ballad. I kind of like that. You know, it's a reference to Dylan, um, but it's not stealing from Dylan. It's just a reference to it's a reference to one of his songs it's that only a Dylan famous. only a Dylan person would get. You know, only somebody who was into Dylan would get. Hey, wait a second, the thin man has his ballad. That's referencing that song. And then of course my eyes look over and I'm like, and the candle has its flame. I was like, well, that's two lines. <laughs> the thin man has his ballad, the candle has its flame. And then the total immersion happened. Then the, the veil just came over, and I don't know how much time went by, but um, I had uh, Country Made for Kings. And, uh, and, and it's about hitchhiking to California. Um, oh, I didn't wow. know that when I started to write it, but it's about hitchhiking to California and back. And... Uh, and, you know, none of this would have happened if it hadn't been for uh, uh, Devin at the Ice House. I mean, I was just happy playing covers, and then he shamed me and, and uh, <laughs> you know, berated me and, and told me how selfish and, and horrible I was for holding back. And now I'm not holding back. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be an amazing album. It's going to be, it's going to be, um, it's going to be cool. And I don't know if I can ever do it again. I don't know if I'll ever come up with a, another group of songs like this i mean this this could be it i could be a one and done kind of guy no it doesn't sound like that's going to happen to you i don't know but i but i don't i don't take it for granted i don't i again i it's you know it's almost like you know when will it stop raining well when it stops and and i'm like you know i i hope these songs keep coming um but i don't feel like i really have control i i can't say well i'm going to write good songs right I, i hope i can i i want to I'm going to I'm going to try. I'm going to put myself in the right position, but they come when they come and uh, you know, you, you can't you can't force a flower to grow. It's better you know? to be prepared for the opportunities than have the opportunities and not be prepared. Yeah. True. So it sounds like you're very open-minded and you're able to look at opportunities coming your way that I don't know, you're just, I take I take it, see it it's it's so it's it's like it's, I don't even want to say it's special or or meaningful. It's holy to me. It's music, music, especially folk music, American music, Appalachian music, Paul Simon, Neil Young, uh, Jerry Garcia. I mean, that's that's reverence. I mean, that's 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 more than special. That's that's that is the language of spirituality filtered through our culture, through who we are as people in America in in this modern day i mean you know uh you know you you don't have a culture without art and music and uh you know uh, 
the sixties was like the explosion of, of, of that revelation that, you know, that, that is who we are. You know, we, we are, we are that. And, uh, you know, I, and I'm, I'm, you know, the next, the next person in line to, to tell that story or, you know, there's, there's going to be singer songwriters after me and after them. And, and it's just, I'm, I'm just in that, in that chain. I'm just in that, uh, in that, uh, progression. When are we going to be able to enjoy this album? Well, um, I should have, uh, I should have all the mastered tracks, um, this week. The artwork is all finished. Richard Mallet is photographing the uh, the final piece of artwork tomorrow. Awesome. And this gentleman here is uh, working on commission to do the graphic design layout of all this said artwork, and he is uh, putting it together and creating some some uh, some graphic uh, art of his own using some pictures I have. And we're going to hopefully submit it Friday if schedules permit. Um, if should be if, just fine. And. Uh, Disc uh, disc makers will have it, everything on Friday, um, and uh, I should get it back within ten business days. So June first, it should be in hand June first. And there's only the thing that's special about this album, uh, as far as the physicality of it is, there's only a hundred copies. Um, they'll be numbered one to a hundred. Um, the back of the album will have a slash one hundred printed on it, and then I will use a fine tip sharpie. And hand number each one that I give out and sign each one. Um, n- none of them will be sold. Um, no donations will be accepted. Um, these are these are gifts to 100 <clears throat> select people. Um, and when they're gone, they're gone. And I'm in no hurry to get rid of them. I'm in no hurry to give them out. Um, they're only going to go to the right 100 people. Um, right. And right now, the first three are spoken for. I'm getting one of 100. That's going in a frame. My daughter's getting two of 100. My son's getting three of 100. And Wait a minute. Why, is, why, why not your son first? Since he's the oldest. Well, because my, uh, my daughter lives with me. <laughs> okay. I got you. She, he's in Athens, Georgia. He's five hours away. His wrath is, is tampered by oh, distance. Yeah, first dibs. I got you. Or temp, tempered by distance. Yeah. But, um, and then Richard Mallett did all the photography. Fantastic photographer. Uh, he, needs, he needs to realize the commercial potential of his uh, skill with photography. Um, he worked for me uh, and was happy to do it to gain experience. And, and he was paid for his work, but, uh, you know, he was not paid nearly uh, what the going rate is. He's um, incredible. He's really good. Absolutely, um, I agree. And and I told him, I said, look, I, I feel a little bad that I'm only paying you this much money, um, which, by the way, was far more than he had quoted me. He quoted me, and I don't want to embarrass him, but he quoted me a smaller number, and I said, "I can't give you that, man. I got to give you more than that." And he's like, "Really?" I said, "Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't feel right having you do this work for that little amount of money." He's like, "Well, you know, it's good experience and blah blah." I said, "Yeah, but you know, your your time is valuable, man. You know, let me give you let me give you X number of dollars." And he said, "Well, awesome. Yeah, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. You know, but I, I mean, it, in in reality, it." could have easily been double that and it would have still been worth it. So yeah. I got a bargain. I got a, ha- and thank you, Richard. Um, you gave me the best, uh, you gave me the best bargain on this whole album process. Uh, Lori Rinkin did the artwork for the CD itself and I got a bargain on that. Uh, she, she did it as a labor of love. I think she probably would have done it for less, um, just because she supports me musically. And, uh, uh, she and I, uh, are kind of like, you know, on the same wavelength when we, you know, talk about songs and stuff. And, uh, but I, again, she did an amazing job and, and, you know, far too little money was given to her for that. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't have all the money in the world to, to give everybody every, everything they deserve as far as, and plus the studio was kind of expensive. Uh, I mean, considering it, it was two trips in, um, and, uh, it was, it was a fantastic value. But it was still a large sum. It was, right. It was and you bit... brought some some pictures with you yeah. or something, right? You want yeah. to check that camera, Caleb, real quick, just to make sure. Yeah, uh, Lori Ann Rankin. She is the uh, wife of Chris Rankin, and she is a local singer songwriter herself, and uh, she's a great singer songwriter. 
and I didn't even know she did art. She was an art. She told me she was a middle school art teacher. And uh, so I figured she was an artist, but she showed me some of her stuff and I, I was blown away. I said, oh my gosh. You know, you, she said, yeah, I, you know, I, I used to uh, have a commercial uh, art business uh, and uh, you know, now I just teach art and do it on the side. And I said, well, I have this song called Country Made for Kings and uh, you know, it's, it's got a lot of imagery and a lot of references to things and I'd like to have this picture basically be a visual representation of that song. And she's, so she was asking me, well, what are the things? And I said, well, there's a train station. Um, it, it's, it's called Inspiration Springs. Um, there's a whippoorwill bird. I want a guitar case. And, you know, I'm, I'm giving her my, my wish list. And I want the train tracks going off in the distance. And I want it to look old timey and kind of maybe abandoned. And so she sends me some pictures. And she, um, I, you know, we went through the pictures. And I said, well, I like this one. Yeah, I like that, you know. And then she sent me a, a mock-up, but uh, this is the original scratch board that is going to be the artwork on the CD itself. Yeah, you want to get a picture of this, Caleb, up, up close, maybe? Well, I, I this, wanted to ask to make sure it was okay with that. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, he, wants, he wanted to get it. That's why I wanted to make sure yeah. at least one of the videos was working, because he wanted to actually show it. But. Oh, my gosh. I've been waiting a long time to see this. Yeah, and yeah. I'm just gonna have to take a second and stare at it because that is <laughs> that's crazy. That's amazing. It yeah. looks so. That's exactly what you were telling me about like, yeah. months ago. Wow. Yeah, yeah Lori Ann Rinkin, and uh, it's a scratch board uh, original, well, consignment piece. I mean, it's it's an original art piece that she. I mean, this is not a this is not a, a, a copy of a photograph that exists. I mean, this is out of her head. Uh, based on some reference photographs of old timey uh, stations, yeah. Uh, but uh, she researched the whippoorwill, and you know what does a whippoorwill look like, and uh, yeah, that and, is fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's gonna look so cool on the CD. And the neat thing is, uh, the CD sits in a clear seat or clear case. Uh, it's the, it's a, like a uh, what do they call it anyway? Um, you put the CD in, it sits there. When you pop it out, the uh, the plastic below it is clear. You can see through that. So this image will be taking up the entire square, and then the CD will have a circular cropped portion of the image, so it'll be like a puzzle piece. So when the CD is in the, in the tray and you look at it, you'll see the entire image. When you pull the CD out, you're still seeing the entire image because it's behind it. Right. And uh, so they fit, they'll fit together like a puzzle piece. Um, so the image will actually be on the CD itself and on the panel behind the, the plastic uh, holder. <laughs> that looks so cool. Very, very oh, cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, so much detail. I mean, just you could look at it for hours and, and pick up new stuff. And when it's uh, when it's shrunken down, it's going to be even sharper. And, and yeah, it's and the way it just trails off into the distance back there oh, is so yeah. cool. But uh, I want to awesome. play that song. And uh, yeah, I was about it. to about to mention that. Let's I, I see. hope you're going to play a couple songs for us. You brought your guitar. Oh yeah. Um, do you want to get into it? Yeah, I think I it's mean, a great time. Yeah, we're two uh, hour and fifty minutes in. We it's usually shoot time. around two or so. So I think if we get a couple songs in, that'll put us right on the money. Yeah. Um, and Ron, you know, it's up to you what you want to do. But we normally shows past we've done you know you've seen it one at the table here and then we do one in the the carpet yeah. corner the carpet wall over here so if you if you got a couple for us that would yeah. be fantastic yeah. take your time tune up do whatever you got to do i just need the uh music stand. there it is yep do you if, if do you want to take like a bathroom break or anything before or? um no i'm good i'm cool after, well, we're after gonna talking about the um uh, roll right into after it. talking about the uh the picture I'd like to play that song. Yeah. All right. But if you guys want to take a quick break, then I don't mind. Well, we'll do whatever. I mean, we are kind of taking a break right now, yeah. so just whatever. But <clears throat> we're still chit-chatting a little bit. If it's interesting, we'll keep it in. You want to set the mic up over there? Yeah, that's the one we're going to use again. Same one? I mean, I figured why not, right? Yeah. I mean, it's right here. It's a pain with this stand, but... Would it be easier to um, just sit here and record? 
Be well, you can do one there, and then we can do one over here. Yeah, we can do two. Okay. Right. Sure. So if you want to do... Which one do you want to save for the carpet wall session? Oh, uh, it doesn't matter. We're all, we're all good. It's it's awesome. It doesn't matter. I like that. Cool. All right. Yeah. Let's do the first one over here. here. Is there um, a mic that... Like a second mic that goes low for the guitar and one for the vocals? I usually or? just scoot this one up. Okay. And it's, it's going to read so much of it that it'll pick the guitar up. The reason Josh's didn't pick it up in the beginning of that one episode is because we muted the mic beforehand. Ah, okay. Yeah, we muted, we muted these two mics ah. to try and focus it on that mic, and right. that, that didn't work. But I don't know if you listened to the latest episode, Clayton Lewis, that came out Friday. I mean, the guitar and the vocals picked up fantastically just off of that one mic right there. So Yeah, it was awesome. So you could, uh, you know, just... Maybe do a, a quick strum and a couple yeah. vocal and just see what you're picking up. That's about where you want to stay, right there. So I think we're good. You can maybe even drop the mic a tad bit, maybe. And it'll balance it out. Yeah, move that a little bit closer. So uh, we got the camera going. Yeah, would you All like right. to let us know exactly what you're singing? Yeah, this is um this is the song that uh, I was telling you about with the the Bob Dylan album, the Highway 61 Revisited, and uh, the Candle, and uh, it's the song that Inspiration Springs Train Station and the Whippoorwill and all the imagery in the uh, in the image or in the, the artwork there uh, is about. Um, it's about uh, it, I mean it's about a lot of things, but it's it's basically a story about hitchhiking to California and sort of getting stuck and wanting to come back east but not really knowing how to make the jump to, to, to head back east uh, sort of being because uh, in California in the summer it's all wine and roses and then uh, when the fall rains kick in they're cold and uh, it's gloomy and you don't want to be out living outdoors in California when it starts to rain in November um, it's, uh, it's like, it's, it's good times until, until the rains kick in. Um, and so this is kind of about being, a being, a, an outdoor hitchhiker, sleeping wherever, outside, living, living on the, uh, on the land. The thin man has his ballad. Candle has its flame. Whippoorwill has had its fill of waiting on this train. Standing on the platform here at Inspiration Springs, back pocket full of troubles in a country made for kings. All we have is now. All we want is yesterday All we need's tomorrow Redemption's on its way Wish I knew a tailor Who could pull a thousand strings Back pocket full of troubles In a country made for kings December gray Hide out in the coffee shop Plan my getaway I'd fly back to Atlanta If only I had wings Back pocket full of troubles In a country made for kings All we have is now All we want is yesterday All we need's tomorrow 
Redemption's on its way Wish I knew a tailor Who could pull a thousand strings Back pocket full of troubles In a country made for kings The candle has its flame The whippoorwill has had its fill Of waiting on this train Standing on the platform Here at Inspiration Springs Back pocket full of troubles In a country made for kings Back pocket full of troubles in a country made for kings. Yeah. Woo! Thank you. That fits. I like Heck it. Heck yeah, man. How long did it take Thank you to write that one, you said? Or do you remember? That was uh, one day. That one day. It seven. seems like every artist I ever listen to, they say their, their biggest hits are like five-minute songs. You know, the stuff that they worked on for three months just kind of falls to the, to the B-side. I, th I think when you got the when you got the clear yeah, channel we, we get in that zone. it comes and and if you can if you can get it all in one if you can stay with it if you can if you can ride it and stay on the horse so to speak and not get distracted or not you know uh, not you know get off track um, then yeah let me do a I think this one is like the one this is the the first one that came to me that really shook me um, where, where I knew it was not me this this is the one that uh, this is the one that that actually unnerved me because I said man that's 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 too good that's that's not me that's you know I, I can't take credit for that I don't know where that came from that's that's a gift that's a gift from the muse yeah so um, Maybe put that mic in just a, a, an inch more, Caleb. Maybe this one. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I think you need to calm down. <laughs> I'm taking over the show. needs to have its heart broken so it can play the way that I feel this guitar needs to have its heart broken now my love must beg borrow and steal I lie away drop night keeping the company of the ceiling fan how I wish I had seen it coming she makes me wish I was a better man this guitar needs to have its heart broken so it can play the way that I feel this guitar needs to have its heart broken now my love must beg, borrow and steal the words I write they can do no justice Words I write can never play the part She's not just gone, she's gone forever and This guitar 
needs a broken heart wants to seek the truth above perfection it's better to be good than it is to be right I lost the meaning when she severed the connection I walk the moonlight home alone every night this guitar needs to have its heart broken so it can play the way that I feel this guitar needs to have its heart broken now my love must beg, borrow, and steal I lie awake in the pin drop night Keeping the company of the ceiling fan How I wish I had seen it coming She makes me wish I was a better man The words I write, they can do no justice Without her now, I'm just falling apart Words I write can never tell the story So this guitar needs a broken heart This guitar needs to have its heart broken So it can play the way that I feel This guitar needs to have its heart broken so we can play the way that I feel This guitar needs to have its heart broken So we can play the way that I feel I do love that song. Thank you. That's I think I told you that the other night. But Is that the song you wanted him to play? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you didn't have to ask. I did not. That's fantastic, man. Thank you. Uh, you can. I can uh, do one more. Yeah, you want to do time. one more in the in the carpet area? Sure. Yeah. We'll move some stuff around and get you set up. That was great, dude. I love. There's a lot of like feeling to that. Yeah. I like that. Thank you. It got hot in here all of a sudden. It did. Oh, that one chokes me up, Ron. I'm gonna be honest with you. Thank you. That's uh, Lori Rinkin. Um, oh, I told I her the 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 first day I was gonna play it at Coastal, I came to her and I said, Lori, I said I've got a new song, and she was like, Oh, great! She was excited because at that point this was my fourth song. So I mean, I I told her I got a new song three other times. So this was the fourth time I'd said, Hey, I got a new song. So, you know, naturally she was like, oh, well, that's awesome. You know, that's, you know, your fourth song. That's great. You know, I said, no, no, this one is like, this one's different. This one, this one's like really good. And uh, I really want you to hear it. And she was like, okay, yeah, sure. Whatever. So, um, I played it and, um, I didn't see her. She didn't come up to me afterwards or anything. And I kind of forgot I'd even told her, you know, and then 10 minutes later she comes up, she, she sits down and she says, uh, She's like, that was really good. I said, I, I said, I'm, I told you, it's, it's a good song. And she said, no, no, that was really good. She says, which was nice to hear, you know, compliment. But uh, what really got me, she said, you know, some songs are too personal. Some songs you feel like you're getting too close of a look or too intimate with the person who's writing it. And you don't belong there emotionally. You're you're seeing them almost like 
spiritually naked when they you know they're bearing their soul in a painful way she said that song was too personal and I didn't feel comfortable standing there listening to it and I said that's that's what it's all about that's that's when you reach somebody that you're not just putting something out there for them to appreciate and look at and say oh, that's nice I like that you know right it's you're 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 making them uncomfortable. You're expressing, uh, you're sharing a, a feeling. But it's not just sharing the feeling because there's a lot of shared feelings in songs, but it doesn't make the listener uncomfortable. Touche. But when you make the listener uncomfortable in their own skin because they're seeing part of you that's so intimate that they don't feel right doing it, then you've broken through. A, that's another level of like, you've really, you know, because, um, you know, you can, you can, pour out your heart and be like I'm so heartbroken oh my gosh I feel so bad you know and and that speaks to the emotion which we've all had but it doesn't really speak to you personally necessarily it's just kind of generally okay heartbreak yeah we all know it you know um, but um, I, I, that was the best compliment she ever gave me I said I said that is awesome that inspires me to, to do more wow yeah I, I can relate to that completely yeah you know, when I first met you, uh, when you and Richard were talking about the album <clears throat> over there uh, at Oak Road, I think yeah. we were sitting at the bar talking yeah. about it. I think a few nights later, or the next open mic, I guess, yeah. uh, you sat down and started playing that. And I was bartending it over at Oak Road. And I knew I wanted you to, wanted to have you on the podcast the first time I met you. Yeah. And um, as soon as you started playing that song, I left the bar. I didn't care who was there waiting to get a drink. I ran over and, and got a video. Oh, wow. And I sent it to Caleb. And I said, this is the guy I'm talking about. This yeah. is the guy I want on the podcast. And um, so wild, of course, it wasn't great because you couldn't even hear anything, you know, from the crowd and all that stuff on the on the phone. But yeah, that's the song. That's, that's funny. Cool. I already knew who you were. <laughs> we met at Blackwater. Yeah. yeah. And I had contacts. Richard had given me contacts on my phone for um, for the uh, graphic design and uh, layout. And I met him before I even looked at those numbers. And I was like, when I got home, I was like, wait a second. I think one of these one of these contacts was named Caleb. Could that be the same one? <laughs> now I looked at the, the the artwork that you gave me that had your name, and I was like, I'll be darned! This, how many Caleb choirs can there be? You know. So far, there's only one. That's not a not yeah. a typical last name. I think there's a Caleb Quarry. I don't think kidding. there is. I'm just kidding. That was a joke. So this song is a uh, is a. Uh, I think it's got a lot of pop potential. It's, it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, a Rolling Stones kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> kind of reminds me of um, Dead Flowers in a way, that kind of genre. But uh, it's about um, my, my wife died of a heroin overdose. And uh, this, is, this is about her. And it, really, any, anybody who's in love with a heroin addict um, uh, who's a beautiful woman... Um, this is this is about the feeling the feeling of helplessness you have um, when you're with her, but uh, she's married to the medicine. All right, Ron Daniels, one more time, Ron Daniel, sorry. Oh, 
stranger to paradise in no danger of compromise just a spoonful of the sweetest lies she's married to the medicine shouldn't let her in We're on and off and on again And I know that I can never win She's married to the medicine She's no stranger to paradise In no danger of Compromise Just a spoonful of the sweetest lies She's married to the medicine She's married to the medicine She always leaves too soon She's married to the medicine Long sleeves in June She's so beautiful when she lies The reigning queen of alibi Raven curls and sleepy eyes Married to the medicine She always leaves too soon. Hmm. What a great song to end on. Thank you. Yeah, man. His lyrics are just amazing. You've done a great job, Ron. Thank you. I'm glad that Devin shamed you into writing music. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll play another one. You didn't have to go on the podcast, but. All right, if deal. You, if you'll listen, I'll play you another one. All sure. right. Actually, I will wrap it up. Yeah, we'll and wrap it up. We're we'll going to get our own little uh, extra session here. Absolutely. So. Um, before you start playing, I want to say thank you for coming in the studio. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. Yeah, it's been thank very you, good. Thank yeah. you for having me. Uh, to everyone else, we will talk to you soon. Yep, talk to you soon.